Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval mercenaries. You haven't probably noticed that from some time I've been making videos about generic medieval warfare topics that work a bit as a glue for the rest of the more ultra-specific ones that I make um, from the cycle. And I think um, it's important to conceptualize comprehensively these topics because I think, in general, um, pop culture hasn't quite absorbed uh, that much correct information, but especially has not stopped reflecting about definitions, what essentially the medieval world was concretely about. There is at least a sort of mimification of the entire um, of the oh, entire history, actually, meant as a sort of story that weird, um, obscure characters like me talk about on the internet, whatever. Uh, but of course there is a lot of competition um, surrounding this, um, let's say, this genre, we can say. Uh, and it's always very, because there is always space for further improvement and better definition, and especially when you have such huge libraries like the ones that I uploaded. Um, there's not just the insight and the perspective uh, from, aside from my background, but also this, say, way of looking at it repeatedly from different sides and different aspects, but also the the possibility really of uh, presenting with new questions and uh, ideas, understanding, etc. So mercenaries fit pretty well this picture because the term in of itself is pretty controversial as you know right uh, how do you define a mercenary concretely like it's just a guy that gets paid for military service well this is true essentially for all the professionals uh, making up the the backbone of medieval armies in, in all their variety so is the discriminant somewhat communitarian meaning that a guy that does not fight for his own community just so sells his services uh, abroad is to be considered more like a mercenary well this also can be debated on the basis of the fact that uh, the medieval sense of community was was very different, both um, spiritually, politically, but also territorially and uh, culturally than the way we intend today, right? We are heavily, of course, biased by the, um, the, the nation-state, by also the Machiavellian distrust towards, in fact, these sort of non-nationals, right, fighting. Uh, in the in, in the Renaissance armies, uh, and we have seen, especially in the videos about modern warfare, that as you know, I don't think ever existed as modern. I think that essentially medieval warfare continued uh, until somewhere in between 1792 and uh, 1918. And I will make a video at some point to explain what what I actually mean by that, because I think that the entire notion of of a modern war, to say, also the the entire concept of of, of the Middle Ages is medievalistic in nature. Right, and there is uh, an enormous continuity uh, with the ancient world as well as, as far as again the meanings, the the beliefs here revolving around uh, the sense of identity, of uh, of duty, and, and and more. Right, are are concerned. So that's a topic that um, today I cannot uh, address as a well, actually a series of topics. So. I have already made videos about this. There is um, a playlist, by the way, specifically dedicated to mercenaries of all ages and other sub ones, right? If you're particularly interested um, in, say, different eras, uh, that deal a bit with these um, sort of um, questions, right? The, the the ethnic backgrounds, the 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 beliefs, the the, the value systems, the uh, also the same dynamics of employment, of hiring. Th this naturally is, uh, of course, subject of so many different studies. Today, I want to keep it relatively simple, talking about what we, in fact, consider, generally speaking, as mercenaries. So, mostly foreign troops serving for pay abroad by conventional uh, terminology, and we will see, of course, how many sh uh, shades of, of the same existed uh, historically. And uh, given that this is going to be a, a fairly long video, I will start uh, right off uh, without too many further introductions. So again, for all the rest, you know where to find uh, the material.
and we'll come back to it uh, soon because it, it is really one of the most important topics uh, about um, not just medieval warfare but about military history uh, in the first place. Right? And you can see how mercenarism had always been there. Right? Europe has this face composed by uh, different cultures, different groups, uh, different ethnicities that uh, separated by mountains, valleys, seas, climatic areas, confer to the old continent this very, uh, in fact, articulated, complex, shaded um, uh, identity and, um, in fact, also military expression uh, of the same, uh, which makes it somehow easier, of course, given that Western historiography was born from within the same Europe uh, and uh, at least its cultural, broader cultural space um, in analyzing, in fact, peoples that at the time were still prehistorical when others had empires, etc., really offer us a unique perspective on the phenomenon of mercenarism throughout the ages in, in many ways. For example, uh, I'm making videos about the Celtic war bands uh, in these days, and we've seen how the Celtic populations uh, did not disdain mercenary work, to say the least. Um, we have seen how the, the famous Roman defeat at the Battle of the Alia River was uh, caused, likely by um, an anti-Etruscan plan, uh, succeeding, by the way, because aside from the... the the, the tribute that the Romans had to pay to the Gauls, Etruria went destroyed in the process, and this was wanted by the the tyrant of Syracuse that was calling regularly these war bands that were quite pra prized and praised uh, in the uh, in the entire Mediterranean. As a matter of fact, uh, by throughout these centuries. These same Romans, gradually conquering the Celtic peoples, employed them regularly as auxiliaries, also given that uh, many uh, Roman uh, citizens were being settled in, in, in the newly conquered areas, also marrying into the, uh, the local populace. And as you know, the, the participation of, of the Cisalpines and the Transalpines during the, the first uh, century BC, the, the first and the, uh, and the second AD, was was massive. This was a, a massive pool of manpower for, for the Roman Empire, right? But just even as normally, like, war bands really do, they sell their service to, to the highest bidder, uh, who gives really the, the best contract, and the same uh, uh, Celtic Gaisatai, uh, deriving their name from the the geism that is uh, essentially a spear slash uh, javelins and that were known as such as essentially professional war bands selling their military service um, uh, through being known through the name of the, their same weapons um, enriched the Gallic contingents in the wars against Rome but would also be employed and eventually went crush, you know, provided by the Romans with, with uh, their equipment, partly relying on the traditional one and gradually, in fact, being uh, subsumed within um, the Roman army. There is a huge aspect of this. I will make more about the Gallo-Roman um, military culture because it's one of the most successful um, uh, civilizational synthesis of of military um, capacity, right? Just like Gaul was one of the greatest successes of Romanization by far uh, and affecting even the history of, of the area, as we will see uh, later on. And we've seen in the videos about the Roman um, the Roman army, Roman warfare in general, that in fact the, the, the practice of uh, having regularly uh, in service more non-Romans than Romans was a bit like the standard, right? The Roman citizenry provided with the bulk of the ultra-heavy and elite legionary infantry that was practically to uh, punch in the face the enemy that had to be, however, pinned down by these other troops that were more expandable, would carry out the, the dirty work, and that were yet essentially paying the way to the heavies that they hoped they would become, right? Trying to earn the Roman citizenship for their, themselves of their children um, and uh, eventually enjoy, in fact, the status that these overlords uh, really had, right? It was really brutal. 
right? Uh, the Romans really uh, made everybody sweat, right, in these centuries for getting their citizenship as far as this really meant everything um, in the traditional meaning of the empire. But the practice continued uh, through another dynamic when the empire also stopped expanding. And at that point, given that, in fact, more or less all the, the peoples that were living within its boundaries had become gentrified uh, and gra gradually also impoverishing themselves because uh, antiquity was exhausting uh, its, mm, its potential, right, after these, uh, these wars, these, these expansions, these um, sort of moral right achievements that were relaxing the system uh, in fact rome began to search for troops uh, outside of of the of the frontier right i made a video about the sin macari it's one of the old ones i, I will perhaps re-upload it with better pictures for the usual issue that we had back then um in any case uh we have made lots of videos on the migration era, the first settlement of the Germanic peoples, um, as far as also the, the Roman army uh, was, was concerned. Rome had always been settling uh, barbarians from the outer side, right? This, this is not a thing um, qualifying the, the later Roman Empire, right? What happened there that was clamorous was the capacity, essentially, of these peoples at some point to exploit this um, uh, Roman instability to enter as wall groups, right, that were more difficultly diluted uh, compared to previous times, given that the empire was evaporating in some areas, simply given that these were the only, uh, the only army left, right, because uh, they also settled in areas that were largely uh, depopulated, they established their own kingdoms uh, from that, in fact, always ambiguous relation of allies, but also enemies that they had had with with the Romans. It's sort of an Oedipic, um relation, right, uh, towards this uh, almighty father, but also an aging one, right, and so the one that you have to uh, step up to to, to substitute at some point. And throughout this time, you know that mercenarism was actually all over the place, Right, uh, and it was intensifying as such. Right, and one dynamic that we will observe in this video is the fact that, um, is, uh, in my opinion, I've been studying, as you know, medieval warfare for decades now. I have my own, my own chevrons, um, academically, and the distinct impression that I've had is that what we see is this constant cycles of, you know, of war bands of invaders, etc. Uh, always has to do with essentially the same cycles of the migration era that are ever more bridled and masked within the process of civilization uh, of Europe so that you wouldn't think of a 14th century German mercenary as uh, its 5th century equivalent, but that actually have an enormous uh, similarity. I will explain this better perhaps in other videos. Ah, by the way, chronologically speaking, you will see it already from the title, uh, today I will stop to the essentially the 13th, early 14th century, right? Because, well, generally speaking, I will talk about uh, the late, the later Middle Ages uh, as well. But I intend to dedicate uh, a whole chapter to the condottieri uh, in Italy, both the foreign and and the Italian ones, in in another video, right? So uh, this excludes in part not Italy actually. Um, but that's uh, say, geographically in the previous centuries, but uh, this very specific type of uh, mercenary uh, business, right, and model uh, that, in fact, has a lot to do with the Renaissance, early uh, modern warfare, and again, that's sort of another chapter, but it's just, it's not much because it's not supposed to be medieval, but because it really deserves to be treated as one on its own, right? Um, so these waves keep on happening. Like this dynamic explained also in the video about the ethnic background of the early modern mercenaries is somehow always the same. The uh, guys from the more underdeveloped places in Europe, right, uh, generally, because there are exceptions of very elite places uh, creating very elite mercenaries, right? But they are uh, overall the uh, the exception, right? Provide with this uh, vigorous, brutal, uh, primitive youth 
uh, that uh, knows just how essentially to, to to massacre people, to cut throats, to, to butcher enemies, uh, etc., that lives still in a condition of quasi-savagery, and that basically, given their poverty and need of, say, employment, uh, are also, given their condition, relatively cheap to employ, uh, and you find them, in fact, fielded by, uh, you know, pretty far away, and you know that fundamentally Europe undergoes this acceleration in the blending, right, also of the various um, national, uh, say, connections, and the broader European identity, as a matter of fact, through this mercenary phenomenon, which I think is one of the most uh, important and overlooked uh, aspects of all of this. Naturally, there were... Um, uh, knights that served as mercenaries, um, but even in that case, you you tend to notice, especially towards the later Middle Ages, that it was mostly a phenomenon of the impoverished one. Right? You you find these sort of cyclical crises uh, of civilization representing this problem of the mercenaries um, that really is not that different from the one of our times, right? From the Celtic times uh, to again uh, the we'll see the, the Germanic ones, the Normans. Uh, the, the 14th century uh, soldiers of fortune. There is always a, a dramatic similarity uh, in all this, also as far as the fringes, especially the Celtic fringe, but not only uh, are concerned. And in fact, there were also famous mercenaries coming from very far away. We know that in late antiquity, for example, the Huns uh, were quite a thing, right? Uh, I think uh, Attila's empire was relatively overrated, at least in the sense of com comparatively to to other peoples that have not been popularized as much, right, but that were actually uh, pretty badass, such as, I don't know, the Avars, for example. I think I, I, I would have, you know, been quite more, more concerned about the Avars than of the Huns, right? Uh, I always urge my audience not to commit the childish um, as, um, you know, pretty uh, simple mistake of considering... Uh, ourselves uh, more capable or more intelligent than a 7th century Bulgar horseman, right? Um, but the Hans were, in that sense, too. I don't want to diminish them. Um, but the, after the crumble of Attila's empire, Hunnic mercenaries were notoriously employed uh, by the Byzantines in great numbers. Think about Belisarius. There, were, there was a great mix also in the Germanic world that had been initially overrun. Uh, by these peoples, right? So that the Han is, is still a, as you know, a, a terminology that, you know, designing uh, this um, tremendous uh, step warrior that lays everything waste along his path and that carries with him, in fact, the, the capacity uh, of doing that, except, you know, the Hans could have not ever overrun a, um, a civilization like the Roman one, uh, nor not a Germanic one that successfully um, blended with with the Roman one in the in the places where it migrated and you know maintained really a sanitary power that the Huns were, were not capable of, but it was in the same World War the first aside from the usual whining of uh, you know alleged mis cultural misconceptions about the enemies etc that it was the same Kaiser that. Um, you know, styled his own troops as Huns, saying literally that the enemy had to fear them as, as much as them. And always remember that the, that war ended in Central Europe, right? That uh, from one side were the Romans, from the other side there were the, the Huns, and the Germans were split between those who remained mostly from the Annex side and those who instead were fighting um, for the Romans within, uh, within them, right? Uh, and, of course, the, the latter system won in that regard. Um, but these waves, right, of, of Germanic war bands, right, were there to stay because they were um, just European themselves, just next door. Um, and uh, this is something that goes beyond the what we call the migration, right, the, the concept of uh, semi-nomadism that we attribute to the Germans that, were semi-nomad just in the measure in which they were on the move as political groups, but fundamentally were sedentaries uh, themselves. But the concept, for example, of the Saxon, right, in later times also the Carolingian one, but already from late antiquity, came to 
address to define this average uh, brutal, uh, bloodthirsty, um, primitive warrior, right, that was considered as a sort of antagonist uh, of civilization. What is fascinating is that the, the same the same Germanic peoples, the Norses, you know, as all Europeans in their mythologies had perfectly the same sense of the fact that somebody else outside as, as a brute, as somebody unrefined that didn't think, right, was even even much bigger, right, than, than the hero, but was fundamentally dumb, but was, was a barbarian. So the, uh, the cultural equivalent was always there and much of um, what is also, again, this idea of the Romans, uh, being particularly biased against these peoples is sometimes just uh, an elitism or a classicism, also fueled by um, Hellenic and Hellenistic xenophobia, as opposed to the Roman sense of admiration, actually, maybe a bit too, even there, uh, rhetorically boosted further, right, uh, to look at the old times, you know, and maybe uh, stressing the privativeness of these peoples from the senatorial side, just not to you know, have uh, yet another province conquered that would bring these the savages in. Um, but that definitely was pointing at the most obvious evidence. These were warlike peoples, right? That the uh, abodes from which they, they stamped were chronically uh, unstable, uh, fragmented, um, uh, underdeveloped, right? And as a consequence, they were always fighting against one another. As a consequence, they were not um, really the, the, the best military as a whole, right? They didn't have, um, say, particularly uh, advanced um, armies uh, in of themselves. But if, uh, in fact, equipped by the Romans, settled in uh, in the within the empire, and so also being provided with the same structures that the Roman army used to supply and to arm um, and to train their forces, were definitely by the fifth the 6th century, essentially matching what had been the uh, the strongest army uh, by 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 standard, by quality um, in the in the ancient world, right? I will not digress on how um, you can hardly distinguish a 6th century, I don't know, Longobard Arimannus from a uh, from a Byzantine Caballarius, right? Especially in places like Central Europe on the Illyrian frontier, but it's evident that times were were really changing. Right, and that um, say both sides had basically uh, been hybridizing themselves, to say the least. Um, this is true both for Latin Germanic Europe and the Slavic Hellenic one. There were, as we've seen, different groups uh, pretty much everywhere, especially the Byzantine army, uh, and being more exposed to the steppes, uh, to the to the Near East, were say more. Uh, say these avalanches of peoples would normally um, come from, right? As opposed to Western Europe, that for a while was was fundamentally just quieter, right? Also because it had exhausted its resources, telling the truth, uh, but it was starting to rebuild. You have really a uh, a new world, right? And at least that's what we approximate uh, to call like the, the medieval one, right? But this uh, idea that terms like Hans or Saxons were ending up becoming synonymous with mercenaries demonstrated by, for example, the case of a leader, Kilderic, right, um, uh, defined as a Saxon by the Chronicles sometimes, well, his name was evidently Frankish, right, um, and uh, the same child of Merovez, so we were at the roots of, of the same uh, Merovingian dynasty, um, and an empire, right, uh, had been himself victorious over the Huns, uh, and uh, this, um, say, hybrid, right, between Germans, Huns, uh, different groups, right, was is, is still quite meaningful. Not just because in some cases they were uh, intermarrying, but because they were, say, objectively close, right? The Franks and the Saxons were uh, just bordering in Germany, and they weren't that different, especially by, by Kilderich's time, right? But the Franks had been uh, more Romanized, not too much, telling the truth. Many people always make this mistake of considering the fact that somebody was just on the frontier as being more Romanized. This is actually not true, and that's the, the reason why there was a frontier there, right? <laughs> that's where the Romans had stopped themselves. Uh, then, say, the gods that were instead also 
recurring as the destroyers of Rome, well, actually they were the most obedient federati and also the most Romanized ones who were even very careful in the way they would exact uh, their loot from Rome because they they still didn't want to be exterminated, almost came close to be uh, by the Romans uh, as, as an entire people on different occasions. Uh, actually, as you know, the Ostrogoths voted list. Uh, but the the picture here is the one, in fact, of the early Middle Ages, where properly the armies change at the very root because this state had disappeared. You see, when Celtic or Germanic warbands were regularly employed all the time by the Roman military, right? these guys sometimes came from places like, I don't know, the Jutland Peninsula. They were maintaining their own identity. They were proud Roman veterans would come back home with with a pay. They would end their their days there. And it was considered, of course, completely normal because Rome was so huge that even after the uh, evaporation of the West, of course, the empire was still there, not just in Constantinople, but in the sense that Romanity was something going beyond um, the same, uh, same, say, legalistic and territorialistic um, terms that the Byzantines uh, were essentially trying to, to convert to it now. Um, and among the many effects of the fall of this imposing system that had, again, supplied a permanent army that was, again, a top-notch, professional, um, qualitative, uh, one really stabilizing with very few people. But this is impressive about the Roman army, is that they were dramatically few. And the first centuries, they just kept Europe at bay, right? The Roman Empire did not end in any border, right? It was as deep as it was, say, out, outside what we consider the, as the Limas. There was no, not even a term used by the Romans, by the way, as it was in the internal part, right? Just by sheer deterrence of these legions. were always politically and strategically and logistically conceived as projected towards this rapid move towards uh, the outer side and keeping, in fact, uh, these other populations there uh, at bay. Uh, and the uh, most important from a uh, point of from a point of view of military organization was in this process in this end uh, the collapse in fact of standing armies right regarding to this as a medievalist I also would have a lot to say because there was never say a point um, in history in which you can't say that armies were true let's say until the nation state right in which um, armies in antiquity and in, 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 uh, in up to the modern age were truly startling in an absolute terms, right? The Romans had come pretty close to that because, of course, they had a, a great concentration of power. But as we've seen, in many ways, they had this various um, contingents of vassals, of subjects, of allies that um, were also highly influencing the same ways of Roman war. And it's not much a point from a doctrinal um, point of view, but it's the political, say, uh, control of these forces that could be seen in sort of uh, different ways. In any case, yes, the, the Roman military had permanent forces that, however, never disappeared in absolute terms, right? You always have, even in the in a comitatus, essentially, like uh, bodyguards, uh, think about the Huscars, think about anyone that, like also in the Middle Ages, were maintained as a core of royal force of whatsoever, uh, and that were de facto permanent, right? Um, so, yeah, the, the modern age didn't really invent anything. You just have these contingents increasing by scale together with further concentration of power, but there is nothing, say, essentially different. Right, other than size, uh, even properly in the political and juridical foundation of why troops had to be levied and and how right in, how this had to be negotiated with the communities mostly, um, that we can say well you know the ancient world was really just like you know we the the nineteenth century the twentieth century that wasn't quite the case, uh, but definitely the collapse of the Roman Empire, so truly meant in its in its deterrent capacity, 
uh, was a huge problem for everybody involved, because, uh, in case you didn't notice from the fall of the Roman Empire, was no power that fundamentally was er ever able to repristinate this in its um, universal unity, and therefore to provide with that uh, very long term of stability that uh, allowed, in fact, most of the, of the world at the time to uh, to enjoy uh, a peaceful reality, right? The, there is no doubt that as violent as still that world really was, right, it was no comparison with anybody uh, living outside, which is also one of the reasons why those people wanted to move inside, because uh, they wanted essentially to enjoy the same benefits uh, of humanity, and the, very often today this is flipped because we live in a populistic Fort Estater delusion in which basically the idea is that it was allegedly free people right, as opposed to the Romans when you actually realize, as we will see also better now, that um, it was the, the aristocracies that um, controlled uh, the communities and the, the, the process accelerated exactly in the, in the moment in which they, they entered the Roman world either in a mediated or immediate way um, and uh, and by that point the con entire concept of, of, of freedom was not just undermined by the affirmation of an elite that is also witnessed by the new style of warfare with cavalry essentially becoming the most important arm um, but the fact that that freedom out there had simply meant that you're negatively free in the sense that you're free because there's literally no order Right, and part of the reason why these people were so warlike again is that they needed to learn how to fight, otherwise they would go down. And hell, they they took down each other in, in ways that were vicious. Right, um, we can say be impressed by the Romans giving, um, um, say, rebel barbarian chieftains uh, as a, as a meal to the lions in the arena, but these were the same chieftains that literally at some point invited the Romans to literally enjoy the spectacle of an ambush of other um, peoples in Central Europe just for proving to to, to the big Romans how big them, themselves they really were. Um, and I really talked at length about the Comitatus, the Germanic war bands, but also the, say, the Gaelic Fianas, etc., to just tell you what that war actually was, which is something that, you know, in at least in a conventional state of mind of, of the 21st century, I think, again, most people are just not prepared to know. But this is also how you actually make a civilization. This is not really a negative thing. Right. What eventually boosted the Romano-Germanic system further was, after all, the fact that institutions were needed standing, that it, as, as all what could be saved was preserved, right? And that, uh, ironically, or maybe not unironically, uh, individual freedom was maintained more from a juridical, personal, and, say, just political, economical way in in the Roman world, right, in Mediterranean rather than, especially the Western one, rather than uh, actually other, other one. This also uh, is, is the product of a contingency, right, but tendentially never forget this dynamic that the northerner is the one that has to break this dam and reverse itself towards it. This is what the Indo-Europeans in, in practice had done, also with the pre-existing population, and reinvigorating actually the same with a, with a new uh, or a renewed spiritual, uh, religious, heavenly principle, right? That the Romans themselves had incarnated, that the same Germans were incarnating. Um, and in the Middle Ages, definitely with that overlapping that we're familiar with, would in fact give rise to the Holy Roman Empire. Once again, it was actually the same Roman Empire. And again, I'm not digressing on this because I made enough videos about the Renovatio Imperi and why it's totally fine to use the term Byzantine, by the way, um, uh, in on my channel that you can all uh, look at, right? But the point, as far as mercenarism is involved, is that such collapse, such fragmentation, but also the attempts um, of, in fact, keeping things together in the Romano-Germanic world um, were essentially... Uh, posing the question of how the military had to be maintained, right? And in, in this system that was more private than before, was, uh, say, public authority had uh, 
um, collapsed or at least shrank dramatically. Uh, the private, the, the, the contractor, the military professional is somebody that can really go out there and banally carve himself uh, a lordship, for example, on, on his own. And this is a, a, a thing that continued for a much longer time than we think, right? Even when we see, I don't know, in uh, Tsarist times, in the early modern age, the you know, Timofeyevich conquering si Siberia, or, and, or the Conquistadores, by the way, that was indeed the Russian Pizarro, just to make the example in the New World, um, you really had this 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 comebacks, because at the end of the day, who does go out there to, to lose so much? Because the chiefs, the, the leaders are um, really good, and, and the troops as well. But that's fundamentally something that just a desperate person can do, right? Again, in, in, a, in a system in crisis, we've seen what the poverty of the, again, pre-industrial, pre-modern pre world really were, right? Um, there are there is a, an enormous literature just showing you how, of course, uh, the military lifestyle was, was sometimes better than, uh, but often I would say even um, than the one of an average peasant, right? But still, it was uh, pretty trashy, right? And still pretty dramatically. Um, dangerous and but not just because of war per se but just the, the general lifestyle um, involved right um, and this obviously speaks of a lack of rule by some degree connected uh, with this again I can't digress on how again true this was up to very few centuries ago uh, and so that there is definitely a successful part of modernity that is actually the same con continuity of tradition as far as bringing together right to the one to God essentially as as a soul uh, as a reunited world a restituted world like the one I know Aurelianus could um, claim could boast to have uh, successfully achieved that was actually even from within the most humble unknown forgotten Milas of the 11th century the ultimate purpose of it all that is to say to make sense right to bring order where uh, where there is chaos right and surely you know spending a bit you know more of energy and creating a bit more of entropy but in in virtue of the transfigurational spiritual force to actually being able to invert the process once that the the situation has been uh, established right this rule has been established um a further problem connected to what was happening essentially late antiquity in the early uh, Middle Ages um, involved the this um, you know the troops that uh, Rome had made extensive use for centuries that now were really uh, in fact l l lose on on their own uh, the general Etius 390 454. Uh, just to give one example, had profitably engaged contingents of Huns, right? Foreign troops paid to fight, called mercenary militas or peregrini militas, uh, more specifically, and um, to to of course establish an, an important degree of personal power himself. In his youth, Etius had lived in close contact with the gods and Huns, and thanks to the bonds of friendship that he had managed to forge with them, he had no difficulty in recruiting um, forces from among those who were hostile, in that case, to Attila's hegemony, to defend the empire. Um, most likely men, again, of different um, ethnic groups, but still available to serve in paid war bands under the generic label of Huns. Right. This this aspect is also very important that when we talk about Hans, Saxons, Normans, etc., we're using synecdoches here. Right. These were not literally people from those ethnic groups, for whatever, by the way, the terms themselves meant, because they were quite vague, right? Um, but they still were about again this outer populations that were habituated to, you know, uh, leave um, across this uh, quite turbulent uh, lands, right, and uh, of course maturing a significant practicality with arms, bloodshed, and any other kind of uh, 
psychophysical preparation uh, for this kind of, of lifestyle, right? Uh, the only problem about these forces, again, is the fact that they would gradually take over themselves, that they would gradually um, essentially defend successfully, think about the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, the Roman Empire, but eventually remaining there. I made lots of videos about the Alans, for example, recently. There is also, we will talk about the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, and we tend to say, oh, look, you know, the Franks and the Visigoths were from the Roman side, and the, the other Germans were from the, the Hunnic one, but realistically, right, it was surely plenty of Frankish war bands, even in, um, in Attila's um, army, by the way, because these groups just went out there historically by um by by tradition by this was thing we've seen also for, for the same birth of rome right that this new cycle of, of um young devotees uh to the deity of war that were literally sacrificed going out there either killing their enemies and um uh, taking their women and founding a new a new life right um or getting slaughtered in the process, also because in the moment in which they entered the war band, they were not belonging to anyone but the same god, right? So their an accomplishment was essentially irrelevant, irrelevant because as those humans, they, they had already been dead, right? And this is what even the concept of the verbal for other... Um, anthropological, folkloristic, but still religious, right, and militarily connected um, practices we will come back on uh, were concerned. Uh, you know that Etsu's um, essentially crushed and deported the Burgundians uh, on the Rhine that had remained in between the Roman and the Hunnic world and were undecided, they had already been beaten by other groups, such as the Vandals, um, and that uh, that incident is recorded likely in the Nibelungen lead, where actually it's, you know, the, the, the final showdown. We're, we're talking, of course, medieval times where th these things have been re-elaborated, but it took place in Vienna, in allegedly Atlas court. Uh, but we think that the final battle in the hall, etc., is, is just the last stand of the Burgundians against the Huns, yes, but of Etius back uh, in the in the 5th century. And that would be really fascinating, because at that point a lot of stuff was mixed in, and um, you can appreciate the beauty of this literature without uh, the necessary historical adherence to, to what happened. But it was pretty much about that, right? Uh, brotherhoods of wars that, for example, had this sworn oath, they drank each other's blood, um, which also had to do with sacrificial uh, you know, human sacrifices, because again, every once in a while they had to kill one randomly to just to show uh, the others that again they were nothing. In that point, it's the, the perfect concept of military discipline. You must de be destroyed as a human being and being um, redesigned, re rebuilt completely out of scratch as a purely slaughtering machine. And thanks God for that, by the way, because um, otherwise we wouldn't have an effective military. Uh, and these people understood it, definitely. And it, you understand that compared to, I don't know, a, a Roman peasant uh, in the Mediterranean that was just under, like so many others, under just one guy that owned all the land across different provinces and that, of course, had disarmed them, etc. Uh, these guys made the better soldiers, except the imbalance between the two systems were, was becoming um, apparent. So this is, in part, at least, how the system really worked, because say, those latifundia were also functional to maintaining a military that, for example, in the Eastern Roman Empire survived, in spite of the of the dramatic pressure, by the way, of these avalanches of, again, terrible nomads that more or less stopped um, infesting Western Europe um, after the migration era, but that, you know, were always next door, and always remember Central Europe is there, right? Um... Germany does not have an eastern frontier of any kind, or it doesn't have an eastern border of any kind. There's just the huge frontier up to the steppes, and as you know, throughout the early Middle Ages, uh, up to even the, the British Isles, etc., the entire culture is redesigned, re-injected, at least reinvigorated on the basis of that knightly, chivalric, um, equestrian, um, sense of heavenly ruler that all these 
at that point sedentarized peoples in, in the first century BC remember their own ancestors back in the day and that at this point thanks also to this collapse of the state the reaffirmation this privatistic culture feudalism etc were um, you know seen being boosted further and in some ways defining a bit what we think the Middle Ages like even in its uh, shortcomings right the fact that this stemmed from the lack of uh, a solid statal authority, control, capacity to enforce a collective discipline, to, to have the resources to maintain large bodies of troops on a regular basis. These are all things that, you know, Eurasia was too exhausted for, and so this is a, a process technically that, as we have seen in the, video, in, in the videos about Chinese warfare too, uh, happens pretty much everywhere. And that has such, uh, such um, various consequences. If Rome, in her last decades of imperial life had deployed armies uh, made up uh, mo mainly of soldiers coming from out outside the empire, right? But, by the way, organized on a stable basis and reinforced in case of necessity by drawing on further mercenary troops. Um, the militias of the Germanic invaders had, on the contrary, a tribal organization characterized exclusively by ties of direct dependence on a clan leader, right? And this would dramatically help catalyze the, uh, the process of mercenarism because their cultures were founded literally on autonomous nuclei that were already militarized and capable of surviving out there uh, in the wilderness, so essentially providing for their own um, equipment, uh, supplies, at least, of course, they they could, they would be often re-equipped, that was the least that could be done when, say, they were employed by some uh, mercenary um, state, etc. But um, they, they were already nurtured, right, in that kind of um, warrior um, fury that if properly disciplined and channeled, right, within the right uh, tracks right next to to other um, forces could not just in fact be quite effective but they could also gradually professionalize themselves at least as true um, in fact true mercenaries at least in in the measure in which they were normally thinking just to serve abroad and to learn that uh, expertise capacity etc that when come back home could help establishing some sort of more uh, stable uh, polities, which could be done only through uh, an incredible amount of violence, given that, again, lack of uh, centralization that exists there. This is basically the story of all these peoples, you know, where or not. This is true for um, uh, the, the Romano-Germanic world, um, broadly meant. Uh, it is true for the Vikings. Right, who does you know pass from tribes to monarchies, right? And they, oh, with all um, a specific ethos that, by the way, was the same exact one that had pushed the again from the smaller uh, freemen to again the the emperor of the world, right? To think of how the latter had to be ordered, right, uh, by divine law, because that was the ultimate point. And of course, there is a lot in here between the zip and the comitatus that we cannot quite digress on, right? But we will talk especially about the latter, right? As this, again, chosen and virtually professional element that had to support as essentially a um, initially as just outcasts, as war bands, somebody who would, again, go abroad live in the, and or live in the wilderness, having this sort of ascetic uh, religious lifestyle, the beast warriors, etc. And later, this evolving in an ever more, again, professional direction, also thanks to the service abroad in the, in the true professional standing armies, um, to become locally the same lords, the same, the same state at some point. Right, not just the mob, right? So in this particular system of social organization, say in the migrate tri migration era tribes, right, it was impossible 
to make a distinction between national and foreign soldiers, precisely due to the absence of a clear, first of all, a clear national identity um, to which to refer securely, because they still mostly identified with clans, and especially the elite that paradoxically would, would be the one that would catalyze the most this process, especially the nobility, right? This process of, say, we are the lords of this land rather than these spirits on earth capable of ruling in other ways. Um, and this true, again, the same exhaustion of the system at the end of the migration era in part to the fact that the world was aging, right? That this uh, powers were not able to recreate the, the universal empire, at least to the same extent of before. Um, and all these, also the problems literally, of, you know, uh, chronological, you know, ends, right, terms regarding to this exploit. Um, but because they were, uh, in fact, attached to their own dynastic power what was to become one, right? And it could emerge only through this incredible sense of warrioristic, um, in fact, selfish uh, individualism, which is the one that exactly, in fact, could was dramatically boosted forward in these um, in the systems because it was the only one available. Right, they didn't have any other mean to create to convince others, or say, of the worthiness of a more unitary cause, unless they show to be that strong individually, and so gradually managing to subject the others uh, and building something more complex. And it took an incredibly long time. Right, uh, the uh, the Romano-Germanic kingdoms succeeded in that um, as a broader continental European thing because they were based on say, essentially the same Roman states, or at least the, the relics um, of the same, and they were Christianized, they had permanent infrastructures, they they, they were living, again, within a, a very different world from, instead, the other side that kept being fundamentally about that sort of warlike uh, divide. In fact, um, this is what happens, say, between the Franks and, and the Saxons. They never commit, again, the, the foolish mistake of thinking that uh, the, the 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 latter um, were superior militarily just because they were more warlike, right? Being more warlike in in a temperamental sense um, has hardly anything to do with the actually it, it's the other way around. It's mostly civilizations that are by far more military um, powerful uh, and advanced because they have managed to monopolize. Uh, violence, right, to, and to give it a more rational, orderly, uh, collective, centralized aim, right? That's why collective superiority crushes the individual. This is what we, we have seen um, um, uh, happening, for example, with the demise of the berserkers within the same uh, uh, North Germanic world, because gradually, again, the sense that you can do better overall if you have a solid rule and some kind of more um, cohesively organized system is concerned, well, is a bit the, the entire history of civilization. Ideally, they should have been all great uh, individuals that would always be free, like in the Golden Age, assuming it ever existed, but that meant to be God yourself in tradition. Um, and of course, all what you see in in on earthly endeavors is just putting these patches that are effectively like sorting out the way to make things work collectively because we realize that the individual is too weak, right? That the man is too fallen. That doesn't matter how much he tries, is going to be overrun by the rest of the system. This is quite tricky. It can go both ways, right? Because you can say that this dilutes, again, the capacity of the individual to fight. And at that point, is this is needed also in the, um, uh, say, in the collective system to for the latter to, to be standing. But from the other, you can use the same civilization to boost for, uh, f further and forward those same beliefs, right? Assuming that they remember it. And all these cultures believed that the world was aging and that of course it would be an eschatological and you can easily see it right well, the the romans uh the germans all passed from a an heroic sense of 
of the of the ruler right uh, to essentially a sort of deterministic fate in which you know hardly anybody can uh, invert the fall right this is really happening from the last couple of t uh, couple of millennia right and just beliefs adapt aside from the last couple of centuries that of course began to destroy systemically any trace of tradition on purpose even though that also means to fail yourself um, and to highlight those who actually maintain it but in um, in, in a broader sense again if you look at the history of civilization in the millennia you have this sense of fatigue right the sense of exhaustion that especially the early middle ages definitely show right uh, exactly also about this dynamics but the sense in fact that still the north was providing this bulkier sturdier um, more you know uh, fighting uh, apt individuals right it's something that will resonate further right um, the sense of the Germanic youth still doing the Crusades right it's something uh, recurring as a as a topos right as a as still this again half in between modernity and tradition where um, you, you, there was this great effort just to evolve from the feudal system to create more powerful system, armies, right? And to just from one side praise the, the individual um, uh, psychophysical fitness and from the other the, the more concrete um, accomplishments of statehood, uh, etc. Um so to to see the return of it, of the idea by the way of a sort of broader s statehood right um it would have been necessary to wait at, at least until the the year 1000 roughly you have the feudal monarchies that start reacquiring a sense of more concrete national identity or even assuming that it had ever existed i mean at least nation at that point is not quite the same that it had meant in, for example, Roman times, right? Um, and uh, we should make a bit about these terms because also the vocabulary does matter. But at least the idea of something more is that nationalistically, right, from our times recognizable does start to happen around those uh, year 1000, where, again, the idea is that more or less everybody in, say, I don't know, in England is not a Mercian, is not a, a, a Saxon, is not a... A Northumbrian per se is actually um, an English, right? And this, um, of course, favors the governmental action. It is something used by the same barons to, again, boost this ideal sense of a sort of English uh, God given law that, however, is mostly about, you know, the prerogatives um, of the barons uh, at the end of the day. So it, it's a grueling as um, complex process that we can't quite explain by that, but it's obvious that when we speak of mercenaries, we must also think, who's a foreigner there, right? Um, the word mercenaries, even at a, I don't know, from, from a, a village to another village, judicial duelists, champions, uh, figures like that, like, isn't that a mercenary as well, where you don't really need to go to the other side of the world um, to, to be a mercenary. But as we will see, right, also human mobility actually was a big deal even in the early Middle Ages, right? Yes, there were problems. For example, the crisis of circulation was a bit general. It was not just monetary, right, but consequently also one of, of the people, right? It made it difficult to find the necessary amount to pay mercenary troops, Per se, which is why we should not be surprised if mercenary troops were relatively rare uh, in this period. But even there, we don't have to forget that, as we've seen there, the, the same chieftains um, creating this bond between each other uh, internationally, at a provincial, but even at a regional or even international level, right, were contributing to this. Um, in Western Europe, practically all the countries had the sense of the king sending his um, children to be fostered um, and made 
in in a, in a foreign court. Uh, there was this sort of recognition of shared values of essentially proto of chivalry, actually, because that is something that existed since the again the the, the Indo-European steps. Um, there was an awareness of the of the importance of these bonds that uh, consisted also in having the elite uh, retinues for you, like foreign princes fighting in your ranks, uh, having something to earn. It was a way to make politics rather than because war is just an, a political instrument after all, right? But this would help teaching, schooling, educating militarily the um, the aristocracy, right? And this was happening at a smaller scale also among, say, the, the fact the provincial one, uh, and so on, right? And those can be considered as mercenaries. There were smaller groups, right? Sometimes we're just adventurers, uh, like the same individual war bands arriving with, with boats, crossing the North Sea from uh, from Scandinavia to, to Britain, right? And founding their own little um, kingdom somewhere. It was eventually subsumed by a larger formation, but that Still, fundamentally, that that was that world, right? These small groups, but still essentially betting everything on the capacity of, of their leaders and retinues to beat right hard to uh, to know how to, to fight and to, to shed as much blood as they could whenever they were opposed in their aims. Um, then things would start kicking in back again. Again, Western Europe is not... There's not a, a, a collapse of uh, civilization to core, right? Actually, Western Europe remains much more advanced than throughout all the early Middle Ages than it's commonly stressed, right? Always remember that, especially in the Anglosphere, the sense is that all Western Europe had to be like Britain, that indeed is particularly under-documented and problematic as far as, you know, just knowing what the hell was going on, Um at, at in, in the in this early centuries, but again, look at the Merovingian Empire, look at the the Visigothic king, look at the the Longobard one. Um, you you do have a significant uh, you know first of all there are large body masses there are millions of people living in there right again there uh, doesn't matter how less they were compared to before or how much less they wrote uh, comparatively. They were simpler societies, but they were consistent, right? And they had their military organization was mostly just a usual one, right? A general levy, and then these private forces that also locally represented the local, uh, the, the the chieftains, the lords, right? And it was gradually, as we've seen very often in those videos about the seigneurial system, the masnata, etc., how, say, monopolizing control, right? This is something that sees its um, made its important concretization in the 10th century, the so-called Iron One, because together with the clashes among the, the post-Carolingians and the second invasions, it was demolding of a, of a tendentially professional elite of the milites, so the, essentially the, an, the, the ancestors of the Said the feudal knight uh, in uh, in the later Middle Ages that was throughout the space inter internationally recognized, primarily by the status, and so the capacity of flying on horseback with a with a inadequate panoply, heavy armor, and enough supplies again to uh, to maintain yourself in that lifestyle, which was indeed professional. Right, so at that point, for many areas in Europe, especially the ones newly conquered by the Carolingians, such as especially Saxony, etc., uh, that would become the next imperial house, by the way, and reflecting that, because uh, the, the warlikeness, right, of tradition, plus the, this, you know, the, the modernity of civilization, there is always, in all the peoples who make it in history, the actual deal, right, not to unbalance that. Right, it's not just one or the other. That's the, 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 the most common mistake that people do. They go either full modern or full traditional, but without acknowledging what your limits are first of all and how to surpass them. Civilization is about the latter thing, right? Um, so gradually things do change. 
right? And always remember, again, that even in Western Europe, pretty much the military standards were the same of, of these, right? You, you, can, you can, yes, technologically, but it, it's very relative, telling the truth. I'm a, I'm a great proponent of the idea that, again, the, the Crusades woke up the Western... It's BS. The, 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 that happened because the Westerners were, at that point, essentially more as advanced as, say, the Byzantines and the Arabs, and they had hardly uh, ever not been throughout the early Middle Ages. Again, I have plenty of early medieval warfare content I studied for, for a long time outside of here, and it doesn't seem to me at all that the differences were that much, because those, also those cultures had suffered heavy blows in, throughout all of this. Let's, let's not forget it. But again, it's a bit the idea of the obscurantism of medieval times, um, and so everything had to be bad for some reason, except it wasn't. Right, it's all modernistic, secularistic mythology. Now, starting from the seventh century A.D., speaking of the Saxons, by the way, this people um, somewhat followed the same faith as Etzius Hans. Right. Uh, in fact, the seventh century, yes, does witness exactly in Germany, in Merovingian Germany, the Avar raids of you know. It's, you know this this uh, cute little you know uh, uh, journeys of this peaceful people right in the, in the heart of Europe. Um, the same goes for the Longobards, etc. But if you look at Western Europe fundamentally, you have a stabilization within a, a core of itself. In fact, in the following century, uh, Charlemagne will essentially crush the same hours that had been spent, and it was mostly the Saxons that acquired Sinek synecdochally, I'm not sure whether the adverb exists in English, but the fame of warriors. This is a bit like a proto Northman as a concept, right? It's again this terrible youth of um, northern uh, warriors, as they are, uh, divided, by the way, into many autonomous entities, and with a single leader who united them, right? Uh, using, by the way, to again, in the primitive origin to seasonally plunder the neighboring populations through short incursions. Um, in this sense, if you look at what the Carolingians did to the Saxons, uh, given the previous uh, relations between the two, it was largely justified. Um, but in, in this sense, the Saxons serving, in fact, also outside their own country, and exactly in virtue of this um, gradual improvement Right from mere uh, raids, right uh, that were just carried out operationally, in relatively simple but also hard ways. Right, knowing how to I don't know intrude in some enemy settlement at night, uh, blocking you know the the routes of escape, uh, knowing say scouting, knowing whether the enemy is is, um, is aware of you, etc. Because also the, the, the defenders were equally skilled, like the same Carolingians as Austrasians emerged exactly from from the Saxon frontier, right, where they, you know, they were more, somehow more warlike. You can see, in fact, that the, Car the, the substitution of the Merovingians with the Carolingians as a sort of, this sort of more were like Austrasians taking over the more soft and up Neustrians um, in some way, but still becoming that fierce military machine because of the of the uh, latter's estates, right, that were needed to have that uh, proto-feudal cavalry in large numbers, as we know in that shockingly traumatic uh, effectiveness, especially from a logistical point of view of the um, Carolingian military machine. Right, so it, it's all literally in the blood of these people, um, compenetrating these various backgrounds, experiences, uh, and so on. Right, and so the the simple opportunity of making loot could open um, your way to uh, much greater, say, professional income. Right, chronicles of the time report that the Saxons often fought, in fact, for feudal lords far from their territories of origin. For example, in 673, they engaged against the Visigothic king Vamba of Septimania, so it's 
today's um, French uh, Occitanians, you know. While uh, Charles the Bald, king of the Western Franks, deployed Saxon troops on the front lines as an elite force at the Battle of Yangland, right? Which was not really a good idea because in this engagement um, on August the 22nd, 851, um, the Breton opponents crushed this uh, Frankish Saxon force. But say, this is quite fascinating. In fact, we will see it better when talking about Carolingian warfare that basically all, all, almost all the peoples that were conquered by the Carolingians ended up providing by substantial pressure from the same Franks with these elite bodies, right, of picked troops, right, Breton cavalry, um, say, lo the Longobard, um Gazindi, the, the, the Saxon mercenaries, they were there on the front. It was a way of controlling the elites fundamentally, but it was also a way to, to um, admittedly, there weren't so many different military styles between them, um, but, say, merging still these peoples together, given that that was one of the greatest accomplishments, as you know, of, Car of, of the Carolingians. As far as creating truly a, a, a Western European identity, also as far as the aforementioned 10th century Milas, uh, with those specific sort of brutal uh, Latin Germanic characteristics, would be profiled like. Also, a pinch of actually of, uh, or more of Celtic um, sort of mysticism and again sacred violence, right? In the think about the Arturian cycle, the the obvious blending with the previous um, Celto, Celtic, Celto-Roman populations, etc. Um, a, a primitive form of medieval mercenary, therefore concerned, this tribal population of the Saxons who remained on still the margins of the unification processes that would lead to the establishment of the first great kingdoms. Picture this, because I made multiple videos on early medieval Germany, and especially on a regional basis, and that shows you how, what I was saying before, there was this kind of huge, endless frontier of some kind, right? Within even the same Germanic world, right? Where do the Franks and, and and the Saxons begin, and where do the Saxons begin and the Danes do? I made a video about um, Schleswig-Holstein just the other week that uh, looks exactly at the first half of the medieval millennium in that regard. Everything was incredibly gradual. You can say that even at the end of, of the Middle Ages, still, these areas were a bit more... Uh, uh, fairy tale, at least, you know, in the dark side of the same. Um, uh, and, and the same 19th century in the, I don't know, in the fringes of the Carpathians, or places like this, we're, we're still maintaining that uh, magic of mysticism, sacred violence of uh, older beliefs, right? The, the Slavic world, by the way, as we will see, and as we will see better now, was was also pretty loaded with that. Right. Um, except it seems that uh, the Germans, at least because the let's say Western Europe was better documented, um, but also more dynamic. Let's be honest, compared to the Slavic and even Byzantine world, comparatively. Again, Latin Germanic, um, uh, Greek Slavic by some degree. Well, we know what the ratios would, would end up to be. I mean so many videos about the Byzantines, not just about warfare, but explaining a bit why, for example, the Orthodox world was confined to a certain area of Europe rather than uh, the Catholic West, right? So, um, partly due to a warrior vocation, but above all of attracted uh, by the opportunity to make money in the, ev in the event of famine, even, or demographic growth, it was not just greed per se, right? They needed, literally, this is the reason why they were so warlike, they, they needed cyclically to to survive because their surplus was often really short, right? Um, and in many ways, even my, the migration era had been triggered by this um, desperation, at least it was a rational process also regarding the awareness of the international situation, but if you are just 
a happily established sedentary people, you do not get on the the move, right? Um, just per se. It's because they were already habituated from all these fights that were going on among each other. Uh, and that's why these individuals or organized groups sought their fortune in the profession of arms. And you can really see this in many cultures. Um, uh, the Vandal one, in the, even the iconographies, etc. You, you don't have much of, a, of, a, of an established order. You don't have much of a, you know, of a demic concentration or communication development, whatever. But you have still in the, in the mindset of these guys that the hero of the situation is a guy on horseback that roams the world and brings order and searches for adventures and grows and is able to regenerate his soul. Um, and uh, finally, actually, in that sense, again, the, the idea that everything ends badly in spite of everything right, is, um, that this guy can do is, um, is always there. It shows you that sense of, you know... Uh, the world is really a pretty messed up place and it's quite difficult just to to especially shed a lot of blood and getting away with it um, it's not much about violence that is criticized at all but it's just the sense of blind violence or some mistake some some um, m misspeech of some sort that dooms you right and if you uh, lower the guard you're going essentially to to just pay for it. It's just what, what happened to the Nibelungs, as we've seen. It's it's just a bit like the destiny of men that sometimes, if can heroically succeed in uh, twisting fate, but still um, ending pretty badly and also in pretty ignominious way. Sometimes killed, backstabbed, uh, while you know not wearing armor, think about Siegfried, think about the parallel with Achilles, you know, the, the dragon's blood, etc. So it's always about this journey ending more or less uh, disastrously in spite of you being the... You know, think about Gilgamesh, Apathy, or... You know, it, it's always more or less the same myth. Um, and speaking, in fact, of the Norse, the Vikings followed a similar path. Again, it's difficult to separate, to, to divide them. Um, say at least as as the peoples of origin from but also in the same military and mercenary activity from say the Saxons for example um, there was however um, a substantial development uh, in, in the Viking era at first their service was fueled and guided by a sort of um, Scandinavian military entrepreneur, let's say, who organized expeditions and raids throughout Europe, recruiting men with the hope of loot specifically. At a later time, instead, the Viking leaders also began to offer their services to feudal lords upon payment of a sum of money or the guarantee of privileges. Right? And, uh, you know, Rollo's settlement in, in the Lower Seine the even just the, the Viking colonization, the Norse colonization, of some areas think about the Irish coastline, the part of the Scottish seaboard. Um, I mean, they got to America um, and and beyond. So some places that were, you know, they abandoned it. Uh, they suffered setbacks. In others, they would significantly um, alter the local ethnicity and, and culture and identity in a way, especially in Northern Europe, of course areas that were less populated was somehow easier for these war bands to, to carry that out. But as we know, the Vikings were also a big deal when they uh, stepped up, especially in the, um, say, in the middle Viking era and, say, in the later one, we still, we, we already see full-fledged kingdoms taking shape, but in that sense, in Scandinavia, so that's the, the future of it, right? And this thanks to such... Uh, also the immense loot that they had received, but also the relations, after all, they had began to establish with other kingdoms. The fact that they were getting Christianized, the fact that this form of organization that we have seen changing, because I made really a lot of videos about Scandinavian warfare, and not so many as I would have liked to, but still very much about this gradual process, the various 
the three stages of the Vi uh, of the Viking era as far as in fact the the, the war band right the the here the say the, the feudal right you gradually developed as such um, in fact this is how the Normans were born right um, the Normans are the synecdoche of the synecdoches at least in this case um, we think of them as the descendants of the Norse settlers and in good part they were right um, they the name men of the north for how they were called uh, gave the name to, to say Normandy again where um, the Western Frankish king had settled them to stem the incursions of other Vikings right um, and as you've seen even they're succeeding in right in establishing a permanent polity with a territorial um, control and so stepping up and becoming really something different from the Vikings right the Normans are really tough like as Western Franks fundamentally because they speak that they are mostly from those places um, they also learned how to fight on horseback better at least than what they did before and I'm actually great you know I, I think that that the Vikings had uh, of course they didn't have such a good cavalry like the, the continental Europeans but they still made it an extensive use of that and I think that's very overlooked in many ways um, but aside from this right they refined their equestrian skills fighting against the neighboring Bretons they got feudalism essentially from the Western Franks so they really and still having this um, Norse fu furor that um, really fueled their their enterprises gave them the sense of, of superiority and of confidence and of um, inexhaustible thirst of adventure right and so it's not easy to simply frame them as such because the term Norman uh, of course betrays the fact we're not talking just about Normans we're talking still about some Vikings I made a video specifically about uh, the Vikings, the Rus, the Varangians, what do these terms mean? Uh, I think uh, everybody f following my channel knows just by by personal interest. But this is the, the scope of the thing. You know, that the Viking era created this enormous bridge stretching from, say, North America to uh, God knows where in these, by the way, up to the RLC and beyond, even Persia, etc. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised to see, I don't know, in I don't know, in Afghanistan, a Norse uh, uh, mercenary arriving in some place and, I don't know, killing a bunch of people, um, terrorizing the others into subjection and really settling there for good and and going with it. We, without that, they, they arrived to raid from the Rus places like Hyrcania, I mean, south of the Caspian Sea, they um they, they could really reach many places and and this thing continued right we see of course the normans say where's when do the vikings and the normans begin or the franks begin in the east for example it, it's not really to be determined right the who were the frankish mercenaries that were serving in the byzantine army at manzikert even before in fact the the desperate emperors having lost um the Anatolian interland would ask for more of these Western mercenaries um, to the to the Pope and to other uh, Western leaders um, to counter the Seljuk Turks. Right? Uh, we are in the 11th century, and again, it, it we are in 1071, and the Viking era is conventionally over from five years. But you know what's the difference? You know, um, in that 1066 is the death of a guy like Harald of Artrada. We'll talk about it now that, as you know, had been literally everywhere in Byzantine service as a Varangian. And so isn't he just like a, a Frank, right, at this point, right? Serving in Sicily, in Crete, in pretty much all the all the Byzantine frontier, not to speak of, uh, of the Rus, of Scandinavia itself and Britain, where he died. So it's that big right as a picture and you find throughout say the Reconquista the um, we'll see it better now with the with the Normans of southern Italy just these groups um, settling like these single leaders settling I don't know in uh, in the Algarves right in, in the Moorish uh, Portuguese frontier 
settling there, and then at some point nobody really commenting on them until the Portuguese monarchy, for example, knocks at their door and says, look, you're a Christian, you're here, you have been fighting against the Muslims, I'm, I'm the bigger boss around, so rather than, you know, fighting, why don't you become my vassal and you can't keep essentially doing your same lifestyle there. This is all over the place, especially in, again, frontier areas broad demand. This is true for the Baltic Sea, the so-called Baltic Crusades that are basically, in, at least from the Scandinavian perspective, just, you know, the Vikings shifting goal from the Western Europe that has become tougher and now keeps them out uh, and just shifting towards the east. Um, this is in many ways the same, the same Ostsiedlung of the Germans, right? In the, 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 um, and I will not even digress on how mixed at a point, for example, the Magyar invasions, even the Western Slavs were with these people. So it, it, that all deserves a better comprehensive insight because we know from, from even the Balkan genetic um, pool uh, the fact that there were thousands, actually, not just the video game kind of elite guy with covered in, in iron with a double-handed Danish axe that was actually Frankish, telling the truth, uh, but literally lots of Scandinavians are settled by the Byzantines in places like, I don't know, or settling themselves, because God knows where they were coming from, through which routes, in places like Serbia or, or Bulgaria, etc., right? So... Um, I should make too many other videos about this that I'm realizing dramatically how much I haven't right so far but this is how much right these terms can mean but at least in a narrower way the Normans are truly Western Franks yes their leaders and some other groups are of Scandinavian descent but they're fundamentally just again this Gallo-Roman Frankish population there are Again, in Normandy, some places like the Cotentin Peninsula, etc., that show this more marked uh, Norse uh, phenotype, etc. But overall, when we talk about the Normans of that take over Sicily, for example, they were French, but from the north and from the south, there were Germans, there were Flemish, there were Bretons, there were Lombards. Uh, there was really a lot of guys there, and surely also Scandinavians, but not to the degree now that the Continentals now were starting to ride the wave, surfing the wave really of of um, uh, of of that enormous continent, massive continental power that had always remained superior actually to the second invaders, right? But had had to mold it in this elite through also exploiting the same invasions against their rulers and allowing these guys to pour in, right, etc. They were strikingly homogeneous, right? The Normans are not in no way distinguishable from the Western Franks in a broader sense, militarily-wise. They were quite, um, quite loaded morally, they were extremely courageous, etc. But this was a general character that you can read about the Westerners and, uh, for example, the, the blonde-haired peoples uh, in the south of uh, Maurice, really strategic, and later on Anna Komnena remaining, you know, struck by these um, blonde, red-haired um, Franks passing by Constantinople on their way to, to the Holy Land, being extra... Like, everybody say disliked them because they said that they were primitives that they were just not like them this is what the same Arabs say but everyone every single one of them said that, that these guys while on horseback were by far the, the, the most crushing cavalrymen out there this is the extent to which western feudalism had engineered this incredibly and structurally solid system and that these peoples were essentially behaving as if they were literally the only people in the world to have courage, right? That they say that it's not to say that they were the only one, but they were self-convinced. This is the most important thing about Western tradition: to be inherently superior to any other people. And if you actually look at their exploit on a battlefield, 
they objectively were. I mean, I, I'm really talking now about the West broadly meant. It's it's there is this Germanic in, injection, this Norse injection, um, but it's still something that, um, f um, you know, it's fresh blood that is pumping, however, into a, a pre-existing body, right, that had never quite died from um, the Roman Empire, the Romano-Germanic kingdoms, the Carolingian times, etc., right? It's the same p countries, the same people, the same forces. We can see splendid examples, uh, such as the one of Tangre uh, Tancred of uh, Hauteville, of whom at, at least eight of twelve sons made their fortune fighting as mercenaries in Italy. Right, William, known as the Iron Arm, was the first to leave Normandy uh, for... Uh, in fact, the the south of the peninsula from really a modest. It's um, they came from the southwest of Normandy. They were they were not a, a made and accomplished uh, dynasty, but they started make fighting as mercenaries for the Lombards in the south, um, and they basically began to hijack the system themselves, right? And there was a lot of back and forth, right? Early acquisitions were lost at the point, but the Hauteville. Uh, definitely, and um, the most successful one being Robert Guiscard, of course, the, the cunning, right, um, who became Count of Calabria in uh, Apulia in 1059, a uh, big date there, and Roger, who wrested uh, Sicily from the Saracens, becoming its first count on behalf of the Pope, as a vassal of the Pope, remember that, in 1071, are some of the most splendid examples. Right, 1059, is the Battle of Civitate, in which the Normans basically overrun the papal army made up of uh, Romans, Lombards, and Germans, by the way, Swabians specifically, um, showing how this world of, say, Germany and Italy had remained, had, like, as post Carolingian countries, they had their own militias, they were, you know, tough, etc., but they were not so feudal in nature yet right, as the Western Franks, where that's really the hub from which this steamrolling machine had been forged, right, uh, Germany was still about forests, and Italy was still about cities, right, and of course, you know, everything does there, um, but, um, you know, the, again, the sense that the, the Normans uh, of Normandy had at that point been embodying a bit like again all the western Frankish world um, this was actually even a bit more peripheral there were some slight differences in the social segmentation say in the wealth distribution but they're minimal right it's still again a, a world by the way it's not entirely dominated by cavalry per se right the cavalry will become fully decisive over over infantry uh, from the, the mid 12th century. Here was just the upper arm, right? So they made it, but they often dismounted still. As you can see from the Bayeux tapestry, they, they were still about a bit, again, just because of the means, right? Even England was not a, a feudal country, right? In Anglo Saxon times, so even when the Normans conquered it and mol uh, molded it in, a, in that uh, Frank, uh, Western Frankish sauce, they were, however, doing uh, so gradually, right? It seems that a little, a slight, um, say, infantry bias does remain in England. It's not really a big deal. It's not, for example, the, the reason why later on the, the English armies would fight on foot during the Hundred Years' War. But um, it, it's still mounting dramatically, um, the, this chivalric uh, force. Right, um, but there were also the say Northmen of the East, right? The Scandinavian populations were protagonists of this further innovation, if you want, in the in mercenarism in the late Viking era, right? When you look at the first elite mercenary unit, at least in a in an institutional sense in the West, um, you look at the Varangian Guard right, in the service, uh, in service with the emperors of Constantinople, 
which not only became famous for its loyalty and combativeness, but it was also the model for many other similar formations. I made a video about the first, say, times of the Varangian Guard that are speaking actually of most of these uh, dynamics, but say you know the the entire story. The Byzantines called Varangians, the Scandinavians who around the 8th century crossing the Baltic and following the river routes had reached a Lake Ladoga and then settled in the Finnish and Slavic uh, Eastern Slavic territories where they played an important role, albeit a semi-legendary one, right? Most of, 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 of the thing had been done by the Slavs really and even as a, a as an elite, they were pretty strong, but they, they acted as the iron arm of powers that they did contribute to establish themselves dynastically, but in relatively foggy ways as well. And they've never been fully clarified by historians, also simply because there isn't much from contemporary times that a certain did the full picture. But in any case, in the principalities of Novgorod and Kiev, Right, um, and establishing, especially in the latter, this quite impressive regional power that, that dominated up to the Caucasus and the, the Baltic and the Carpathians and uh, even there further east up to even the the Volga. Right, we, we may we talk about the the Bulgars of the Volga, by the way, that received there lots of interesting influences, militarily speaking. And already starting from the 9th century, the Byzantine emperors had at their service the Kievan Rus Varangians assimilated with the local Slavic population, this is important to stress, experiencing their value and reliability. In 988, the agreement that married the daughter of Emperor Basil II, Anna, um, to Prince Vladimir of Kiev included the gift of a contingent of 6,000 Barangian warriors to form the emperor's personal guard in Constantinople. The Barangian guard was born, right, and the cathedral of Hagia Sophia still preserves runic engravings left by the Varangian soldiers, famously enough, that were perhaps bored by the long and exhausting Byzantine ceremonies that were really something um, barely understandable at least in the way they had formally developed, and but the Norse were pretty impressed by Miklagar, the great gate, the great city, right? Um, that was Constantinople, of course, for especially from an Eastern European perspective, from a Northern one, too. It was uh, an enormous deal, right? And to be in the service of such great lords, because it was always still like uh, you're you're bigger. Right, the sense again that the Roman Empire had never quite ended is proven by the fact that uh, not just basically every, almost every Romano-Germanic kingdom was claiming some sort of victory of 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 the empire in in, the, in his lands, but in the tenth century Anglo-Saxon Britain, you find some local rulers styling themselves not imperator but basileus literally in Greek, right? And they're literally on the diametrically opposite side of Europe from Constantinople. So that speaks volumes about this relation of master and subject and sort of empire and and peoples that uh, were all one actually in the traditional understanding. Um, as I was saying before, what, what is really striking about the Varangian Guard is the fact that it wasn't really, again, just a guard in the sense of a... a this, this is true for most guards, even when we look at the Gulams or the Mamluks, uh, these various regiments, but they were entire armies, tactically complete units, so not just, again, the, the heavy infantrymen that the Norse, uh, the, uh, the, the Rus were famous for in that... Uh, I made, again, lots of videos about their arms and armor, etc. you can't check out. They were pretty heavy and somehow epitomizing that sense of warrioristic individualism, but already in a seigneurial direction. Uh, but the actual, I don't know, even cavalrymen, uh, lighter troops, uh, finely ranked soldiers, right? And, um, by the way, equipped with, through the, the dramatically advanced 
uh, Byzantine arms and armor uh, stored in the palace, uh, imperial, imperial palace arsenals. Consider that the Byzantines were really at the top of arms and armor technology at the time. There was, this was the period also of the presence of the Nikephorian cataphracts we're looking at. Incredibly heavy troops, yes, but this were still the exception. There were lots of other lighter ones, and so actually many more thousands of Scandinavians or Slavs that were um, about the service. Um, Say so the Byzantine Emperor Basil II and I made multiple videos about him, also about the say the, the cost of this of the military expansion, etc. Had very little trust in his um, aristocratic subjects, right? As you know, he was trying to boost still the the previous uh, system of of the peasant soldiery that in the Byzantine Empire had relatively preserved itself. Um, but overall, the seigneurial power. Of, of the aristocracy was rooted in the provinces and these were too prone to intrigue and betrayal. So in 988 the emperor soldier wanted to entrust his personal security to foreign soldiers famous for their physical prowess and combativeness. Um, but above all given the role that they should have carried out to their due to their proven loyalty. In theory, the mercenary as a foreigner is not supposed to be about the local intrigues and factions, right? Until at least you... because it depends on you, right? He's just a, he's seen as a tool of your power. You can try to to buy them out, um, but let's say to... also after they're settled, they become territorialized, they become part of the system, right? Um, but indeed, uh, this mechanism could be repeated for centuries. Indeed, the Empire of Constantinople represented a generous employer for individual Scandinavian warriors in search of fortune. But also for noblemen exiled with their entourage from their lands of origin to some political military reverse. And you can't quite say in the Varangian world um, what's the difference, because the war band's leaders are um, are a noble band technically in, in that world right just per se right they they come also from these houses as they're constantly again fighting against one another constant instability um, there is always somebody to employ from there right um, and as a consequence they're also very competent with war with at least the craft of arms Right, they're very, they're also pretty robust men. Right, the the harsh weather of the north, but even more the the literal evil of this political drama is really selecting people biologically. Right, in an incredibly and traumatically shocking way. Right, Harald Ardrada was like two meters tall. Right, he he lived out there as an exile in the woods. He had hundreds of followers when he was 16 or right so that tells you what these people concretely were also from a physical point of view which again it's actually the mind that really blows your own um, when pictured but the I don't even know how to stress the the, the level of absolute and primitive violence that exists in this world it's, it's not just when I say primitive, I don't mean backwards. I mean literally the sense that uh, violence is just something that you use habitually in everyday life without even thinking of it. Like, you know, crushing somebody's skull with, with your hands, right? Without and This was... Um, the, the Normans were in part of our anecdotes about this. Um, the world at the time was generally speaking more violent, but these people transcended even what was the average of that world by far, right? And there are certain things that simply cannot be said on YouTube uh, in, in terms of what this practically meant. Um, but to say the least, the mercenary career constituted for them a more than dignified source of subsistence, even if only temporary. Because 
it was a big deal if you remained alive in the first place, right? So it, somebody that would serve for a very long time, like uh, Hardrada, was uh, just a testament, just by the same fact it was alive, still alive, of the quality of the man. Um, he's definitely the most famous member of the Varangian Guard, right? In 1030, just again, 15 years old, Harald was wounded in the Battle of Stikelstad in an attempt to restore his brother Olaf to the throne of Norway. It's all a story, again, I made a video about medieval Norway, but we'll have to come back on it. And in that occasion, Harald had been forced to flee. He had taken refuge first in Kiev and then in Constantinople where he was hired by the emperor with his uh, entourage of Norse, Slavs, Rus, as, as the synthesis of the hybrid, also Bulgarians, by the way. Um, they were really, again, it's just like we say, the Rus, who are the Rus, exactly. Right, it can be. There are lots of people. They're mostly Slavs, but there are these Norse ones, but there are some Turks, uh, there are people coming from God knows where, telling the truth, think about the Saporozian Cossacks later on in history. So, uh, this pirate nest on the great Russian rivers, one of the largest and uh, inextinguishable pools of murderers, assassins, criminals, right, for not talking about further east or further north, right, so, and everything was that vicious which is incredible, right? But in the Varangian Guard, uh, Harald soon assumed, uh, thanks to his qualities, a preeminent role, perhaps becoming its leader and accumulating fabulous wealth over the course of eight years, right? There is a lot of stories, right, including romance and plots and um, in trees and lots of campaigns, right? This entire it's a proto chivalric reality where the, the guy fights for his beloved and the princess of Kiev for whom he had to be adequate in, in accomplishments to accumulate that enormous wealth uh, in before settling down, etc. And he would iconically die in the Battle of Stamford Bridge on September the 25th, 1066. Um, at the hands of the Anglo-Saxon king of England, in fact, Harold Godwinson, which, uh, as you know, uh, just a few weeks later, on October the 14th uh, of the same year, fell at Hastings, right? Um, uh, not having, let's say, much time to enjoy the victory, and, uh, in fact, dying uh, by uh, the the hand, at least, at, at least to Snorri, Sturlus, and Sagas of an arrow, right, uh, from the army of William the Conqueror, now William the Bastard, um, Duke of Normandy, right, so you see how the circle uh, closes, but this is hyper-famous history. This anecdote, once again, brings us back to the theme of mercenaries. First of all, because William himself made use of a large contingent of Flemings, or Brabanson, uh, they would be known later on, coming from the county of Boulogne, of which his ally, uh, Eustace II, was lord. Uh, and in those years, in fact, the same Flemish had become synonymous with mercenary, as a synecdoche, just as previously happened for the Han and the Saxon, um, these areas were rich enough, they were, they were actually civilized, so you see um, now some, some forces that are actually still pretty much um, primitive, if you want, and feudal, but that are also stemming from places that are experiencing um, an important growth economically. Um, then you have the defeat uh, of Harold Godwinson forcing many Anglo-Saxons famously to abandon England as political exiles, and, and some of them would find refuge in the ranks of the Varangian Guard in Constantinople, whose composition from then on ceased to be exclusively or at least mostly Scandinavian. Uh, and um, the, you know, at the Battle of uh, the Iraqian between the Normans, 
and the Byzantines, the uh, the, uh, the the Varangian Guard suffered traumatic losses. Right, it was was crushed, uh, and that was also a sign of the times. There, there were um, Anglo-Saxon troops fighting in Epirus uh, against the Norman invasion that was now from Sicily um, in southern Italy the greatest threat to the Byzantine Empire, way more than the Seljuk Turks uh, in the east, after all. So here there is again the affirmation of that um, more structured model, right, of civilizational interaction and of political, military and social, right, um, uh, complexity. That's so even, for example, as far as the ship uh, say the ships of William the Conqueror's fleet for in the invasion of England, the arrival in Normandy of some Byzantine carpenters, right? Um, so a lot of knowledge, crafts, skills, etc., that are put in common can be found on the market, and that in fact um, increased the uh, the range, the the availability, the um, the effectiveness of mercenaries, right? So the era of the Varangian Guard would not be over because they kept distinguishing themselves in countless feats of arms um, as their mere appearance on the battlefield did generate ter terror among their adversaries. But at the same time, in a more international way, in a more professional way, uh, without mentioning that uh, Westerners from all over Europe were settling now even as adventurers in the Balkans, in uh, in Anatolia, the famous Akritai of later times, right? They were often just like a part of. This was happening pretty much in like with the Ostsiedlung, um, as well in Central Eastern Europe, the Baltic Crusades. But you have literally, I don't know, the King of Hungary hiring lots of Germans, French, Italians, Englishmen, Spanish, like all that much you have the West that is literally overflowing right and becoming really a uh, a torrent of, of force the fact that Constantinople was able to equip herself with mercenary forces by paying them handsomely by the way did not depend so much originally on the availability of circulating currency but on the ability to collect taxes that finance the imperial coffers and the huge military expenses. So that tells you how advanced, say, the Byzantine world was for Scandinavia, right? Where there was no state um, and where, in fact, permanent armies could not be maintained, um, if not through looting and some sort of incredible effort that would, however, bring to a relatively short-term um, accomplishment regarding unitary forces, etc. Right? It was not about storing lots of precious metal, it was being able to, to replenish it and to constantly reinvest it, redistribute it. Right? Um, this would become the, the great uh, problem of most powers at this point, having enough regular income in a statal sense, that's the passage there in the high middle ages we were talking about before, in order to maintain some de facto permanent amount of forces that were a mix, as we will see now, feudal levies of local militias, but also foreign professionals that began to play really a great role uh, in this all. Needless to say, there was a great, um, let's say, proximity between the first two groups, meaning that while the peasantry was becoming ever more subordinated to the elite, um, a vassal right, could, that owed to, say, the king a certain military service, first of all, had this regulated by extremely precise and actually very short term. And the problem was not much the fact that they didn't have the actual resources to serve their masters more than, say, 40 days. It was, would become the standard right during the season. Um, but they wouldn't necessarily align with him um, regarding the employment of such forces for which they could actually sell their own services, sometimes 
as an extra to their same monarchs for a higher price, or they could simply serve elsewhere. Um, and this was still held by the, again, basic principle that um, every lord was a, a free man in his own right. He could have different allegiances to different, he could uh, make different pacts with different other freemen, right? And um, the statal duty again to the monarchy, etc., was just something very new. Um, and uh, very difficult to affirm, so much so that the same kings had elevated themselves, not, say, just because of some abstract notion of, say, order, but the, first of all, the, the functional effectiveness of the same, but secondly, the fact that they had been themselves feudal lords in competing, competing with the others and finally emerging victorious. Right, made really lots of videos on this, especially look at the post Carolingian history playlist. Right, or one about uh, the seigneurial system or the feudal monarchy videos, etc. That gives you a dimension of how um, gradual this was, but also by how big the phenomenon was and how generalized in Europe it really went doesn't matter whether there were some areas that were less feudal, their member, the city was more important. This thing takes an enormous momentum that basically doesn't stop even after the, the mid-14th century crisis. And most of what we see in the modern age is still part of that. Right? So with the new millennium, the second AD, um, such political and social conditions also began to manifest themselves um, as far as this new say, type of military business is concerned, allowing kings and princes to begin to equip themselves with permanent troops. We can say again, or and or better, having in these, after all, few, Knights, because they cost an enormous lot. I will make a video about the cost of a medieval knight socially, but they were so elite, right, that they, in fact, were becoming ever more uh, powerful. And even, like, a, I don't know, some tens of them were a big deal, right, when facing even thousands of, um, of peasant levies, as opposed, say, that weren't even necessarily fielded in that that function. Again, very gradual in time, infantry was still scary um, uh, and would always remain, even when it was actually under uh, the feudal cavalry for for a good 150 years. And I made a video about this, which is titled On the Constant Nightly Awareness of the Infantry Potential, which is something that instead you've been told, ah, but no, it's not true, that the noblemen were just a bunch of idiots who didn't understand how to use infantry. Yeah, sure, you would have been surely better than them. Uh, there is no doubt. Now, the feudal levies had never proved uh, to be a particularly efficient war solution, nor a political one. I mean, the Carolingian Empire had literally collapsed because of that, right? This sort of prepaid system for which I give you the literal means that serve you to equip yourself, namely the land, and I can't control you otherwise, but you owe me fealty. Well, that's how the system collapsed. Uh, but not entirely. Like, at least there is always a sense that the monarchy can legitimize this power and not. So um, there's a very interesting, as vicious, but incredibly effective uh, mechanism that would gradually glue together from the very root, blood, and, and soul of Europe this um, feudal establishment. So the, the feudal lords were often reluctant, as we've seen, to contribute to the military adventures of their masters, um, and the recruitment among the plebeians of the cities and countryside pro provided troops of generally little value, but especially little experience, right? Uh, impoverishing the countryside labor force, which was incidentally the one paying for this system. And if it sounds strange to you, well, just welcome to real history and not uh, historical materialism. That is to say, of course, this system of lordship had been consensually affirmed 
right? Or better, there was no choice about it, because the peasants preferred to trade their own liberty, the fact of for their own life, right? Given that without protection from these lords, they would have hardly made it um, and uh, out there, and always in a negotiable way. I mean, the peasantry still was fairly combative, right? But just you know, could not mount uh, now a, an expedition, I would say, of a big army of hundreds of kilometers, like this one has said routinely did, right? Um, so that's the point, right? You look at the first crusade, the one of the barons, right? What would good Frey of Bouillon from Flanders know about Palestine, right? But they mounted up a hell of an expedition that not just went there orderly and Tidily as much as they could, of course, under enemy pressure, but even managing to seize Jerusalem. That's the, and we are in the 11th century, so that's the, the shocking, um, competence and capacity of Western military culture, um, already. But in any case, much better um, was um, the, the the sense of uh, dedicating to fully as an elite to military uh, activity in general right uh, this is not to say that the infantry is or you know other lighter troops were not there at all right um, there was a general concern that the that these troops could become so skilled as to rebel against the lords but really the system had developed in that direction because it worked with that balance, right? So the political, military, and social concerns had made it pretty universal uh, in Western Europe, this kind of um, dynamic for which, you know, again, the peasantry would live on their own lives. Also, suffering from the wars were actually increasing, right? But still, if you were from the winning side, it would also uh, essentially benefit uh, broadly from it. They would pay their own cannons to the sovereigns. Um, and uh, the uh, the same was happening, though, between the vassals and the king themselves. Right? The, um, for example, the scutage, where it was aggressively inter intended for the payment of the soldiers and leaving the war on uh, even ever more specialized professionals in a way uh, of course there were some exceptions right uh, for example in the case of the warlike um, city armies not just infantries of the Lombard League that opposed the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa in the 12th century we made multiple videos about that just recently and uh, uh, similarly some various communities in other areas of Europe right but these were realities that in the long run had to deal with the convenience of distinguishing hard-working civilians from actual soldiers anyway, right? So, the, for example, the Italian infantries were definitely the, the most developed at the time, right? But they were still malicious, right? When you look at the Normans, for example, um, they had this, they dismounted often, on foot, you find the same equipment for infantry in the first lines and then the knights. But in fact, that happened because they were often the same knights dismounted. Right? So when you look at, especially this period before the early 14th century, you realize that also in Lombardy, uh, it was the militias that were in charge of the situation. And the infantry were very strong, at some point even uh, withstanding uh, enemy cavalry charges and but but always pulling it off against them because they were say helped um, by their own cavalry that always proved successful nobody was saying we must use just infantry why the entire society works so well <laughs> with that um, tactical articulation right unless you're not just a, a very you know as it would happen in the early 14th century, think about the, the Flemish, the Swiss, the, the Dittmarscher, the Scots, you, you are fighting a war and you have mostly those kind of forces, then yes, but they're 
relatively marginal phenomena, right? Even the the English armies of the Hundred Years' War actually have nothing to do with the commoners. They have to do with the monarchy. And incidentally, from a tactical point of view, the fact that they were attacked by much larger French armies on that they would have not liked to face, but they were forced to, and so they preferred to dismount because even because charging um, frontally was was just at that point uh, unequal, and it was better to try to exploit the defense at some stratagem rather than uh, that more conventional confrontation. But for the rest, the 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 system does remain about the, the traditional roles. The first groups of standing armies were formed by recruiting and paying royal vassals, that is to say, young noblemen of feudal lords that were really, again, the, the best, um, the youth, right, without land ownership still, and uh, evidently embarked on a career in arms, right? This is the, the right of firstborn uh, inheritance, firstborn son of primogeniture, really, um, was affirming itself also gradually, especially in the Nordic world where more or less the tribesmen tend to split equally, right? Uh, which also caused all those feuds, etc. Now, instead, society was being more disciplined by the monarchies, by the church, and this was tidying things up. Only one guy inherited, so to maintain that sense of, again, greater authority and collective discipline and forcible while in fact these other elements would try their fortune abroad which could be also very rewarding sometimes uh, there was all a you know not just a sexual tension but a matrimonial policy behind this courtly literature is very eloquent about this so we will see this perhaps uh, better on another occasion, but it was like through the Crusades themselves to channel these incredibly violent European youth into the the best direction, and also with astonishing success. I mean, the Baltic, the Reconquista were fundamentally successful. The Near East wasn't, but also because you know Europeans had something else to think about, namely creating a civilization at home and concentrating those forces mainly there, because that political fragmentation uh, wouldn't make it yet to, let's say, to, like, the Roman Empire simply reconquering the, conquering the Near East and keeping it under control for hundreds uh, of years, right? Um, it was just another situation. We'll talk about it uh, in another time. However, with these um, royal vassals, the sovereigns guaranteed themselves not only an armed force always ready and under their direct command, but also a source of income, because on occasion they could be literally rented to other sovereigns who needed them. Right, so this favored the, um, of course, the, the, the mercenarism per se, at least this professional system that would render these troops ever more internationalized competent, uh, better supplied, uh, armed, and experienced. Furthermore, um, the European landscape began, as we know, to be characterized by castles, which had always been there, but at this point it started being erected for bigger strategic purposes in stone, on a regular basis, at least for the group. The strong in the strongest European monarchies, uh, with as with some marvels of military engineering. I made a video about the cost of these castles, especially in, in England, in France. It tells you how vital they really were. Um, of course, they were surrounded uh, by massive walls. If you look at the city once, you realize that from the Roman um, ring. A time they could build even up to a third wall, right? So never underestimate their the role of the city that in Western Europe had in different ways, but uh, never quite died out, right? And we tend to think that again the world had ended, but no, the Middle Ages are not 
just countersiding, countersiding, countersiding. They were cities, right? And they had always remained, in, in a sense, at least a strategic cornerstone. Not necessarily a political one, but very often so, at least not in the capital sense that we attribute it today. But now they were really massive uh, infrastructures as they had remained from Roman times in the most, um, especially in Southern Europe. This, by the way, also required the garrisons to permanently occupy such fortifications at large. So. Uh, even there, of course, there were different systems. The same communities that inhabited these places were called to carry out the watch, etc. But all this requires still a political direction, it requires money, it requires technology, right? Uh, the communes are accustomed to mobilizing their forces only in times of war and involved in increasingly frequent conflicts reorganized. Um, their forces uh, by equipping themselves uh, with permanent ones, right? And this is also, in fact, an enormous deal because if you look at especially the Italian city-states that really create territorial dominions, well, th you realize that these are not different from the other feudal ones when uh, in terms of concrete uh, power, right, and, and, and manpower specifically, because they have their castles within the city gates, right, and they have the same identical types of troops, plus they have an enormous economical, uh, fi just financial power, I made just a video about this recently, so when you look, for example, um, at the Venetian Pisan, and above all, famously the Genoese crossbowmen, um, you realize that although they were born to fight on the ships of the maritime republics, they would end up becoming highly sold after uh, land mercenaries. They, the same phenomenon affected archers, pikemen, halberdiers, and later on, above all, artillerymen, the most coveted of all. But that is something for the later Middle Ages that today we do not really arrive to, at least in the meaningful spread of, of artillery. And the important thing to stress about this um, is the specialization of these infantry and the fact that they weren't just against some elite um, forces, um, say just numerically and, uh, uh, and qualitatively, that were sold to some country out there, uh, which did happen as such, but also in consistent numbers. But they stemmed from armies that were essentially using them in a in combined arms tactics, right? For example, the uh, say there were entire ar armies like the largest ones in Europe, by the way, the aforementioned it Italian ones, right? The one of the Italian communes began to hire lots of mercenaries for the cavalry, while they had very tough infantry, and they would create a perfect synergy with different lines in depth with. Uh, pikemen and crossbowmen on the wings um, fight, confronting each other while cavalry did so and if they managed to crush the enemy wings they would close on the enemy flanks um, uh, the flanks of the enemy cavalry and they would take it out and this was a, a, a massive system with armies that were again second or equal actually to only to the, to, to the French uh, royal ones right um, and that um, inexplicably still in historiography do not find the adequate uh, the adequate space for. So there is, I, I would like to point out this regarding this, the specialization of infantry is that it was after all very homogeneous throughout Europe, meaning in the typologies. Right? We often think that, again, oh, look, there are the Flemish, they use the Golden Dags, or uh, the Swiss, they use the Vogue. But technically, if you look at the types of troops that were used all over Western Europe, they were pretty much the same, especially by the 13th, 14th century. There, there is no difference between, say, a Portuguese or a Polish uh, or a Norwegian or a Sicilian knight. They basically... Uh, are equipped all in the same way, and everything is um, is, is also evidenced by the, the incredibly synchronized uh, 
uh, development of various elements of the uh, the the knightly armor that would just be all like in uh, paralleling each other in in a matter of a few years really so that tells you how systemically also rigid as effective and rational the system really was compared to the idea of, of a middle ages where everybody was fighting in a different way and or they were simply poor or that armies were you know, sucking. actually the peak of the great medieval civilization before the crisis in the 13th century provided us with some incredible armies. You have even this in peak of professionalization among uh, the knights that brings the, the former squires to be de facto equipped in the same identical way of their, as their masters, so that you don't find even too much um, lighter troops, because you can start using these uh, numerous professional ones. Then, with the mid-14th century crisis, if anything, the numbers shrink, this is true, but the quality there remains, and even more, there is an even greater, um, let's say, uh, an ever more increasing gap between the elite troops and the rest of the population. So that there you see the period of the soldier's fortune, of the condottieri, of the indentur. So we will talk about those in another video because they are really. Mm, Peculiar, and it's not this world anymore, right? This great parabola, right? Stops at some point, and then you start something really different with the 14th and 15th century. Just by degree, right? It wasn't a radical or essential difference, just per se, but uh, it's a systemic one that you you may want to appreciate much more than it's been usually done. Um, Starting from the 13th century, alongside the city militias, the feudal levies and an elite of warriors by birth, um, so a now consolidated and recognizable nucleus of soldiers by vocation or necessity, by the way, emerged. Right among these professionals, there were really mercenaries, um, especially in the infantry, began to play um, an increasingly considerable role. Right. The 13th century is really the watershed in this regard. As we just observed, uh, this is the moment in which professionalism uh, saturates the market in the sense that um, it's... Uh, actually, the market is expanding for them. But uh, at this point, feudal levies, the traditional forces, do not quite... The non-professional ones, to make the long story short, do not quite seem too much effective anymore, right? This is not really true because, again, we are at the peak also of, uh, of infantry um, yeah, development in parallel to cavalry that is still uh, superior to it. You have in the early 14th century these infantry victories uh, only, right, across Europe. Um, but uh, the latter are just like a um, pale strike, Right, they they make this exploit in the first half of the 14th century, and then they die out because they're as commoners as peasants. Again, they don't really go much everywhere, anywhere. Right, in the late Middle Ages, you really have just um, some very poor soldiers that the great princes of Europe have the money to train, equip, etc. So it's very different from those spontaneous movements. But the rest of the soldiers become ever more readily and easily identified as true professionals, not somebody who's just called by a levy to fight, as it would have been more likely in the previous centuries, right? When the, when the feudal system still somehow worked, right, on at least on paper. So from an economic point of view, these mercenaries were convenient because they represented only a temporary financial commitment, provided that one had foresight at the end of the war to abandon them in enemy territory, or in any case outside one's own borders, which is not even entirely true, right? Um, uh, indeed, without sustenance, they were often transformed into ravenous bandits, uh, and at, at some point they were really uh, used as a weapon like this when they, their services were not longer needed, but especially in the 13th century, warfare was... 
so continuous by s such big powers that these would always maintain these guys on the longer run just they were more reliable than the local vassals right and so there was a process by the way a block of of knighthood that would overlap with the higher nobility uh, not quite entirely but still um, leaving out lots of other uh, troops that were just say no aristocrats that were at this point becoming the actual mercenaries right so everything goes at its place um, and that's how the importance of mercenaries grew rapidly from a military point of view that's where you have these troops for rent right the first companies that we can say existing in a truly again condotta or indenture style begin in the 13th century before you would have practically the same thing but not in this intensely um, systematic and documented way right but they are technically the same thing that as we've seen since the Celtic war bands before uh, had always been around uh, on the battlefields and in particular during sieges these forces would uh, fight just as the shock element right while infantry was um, more important uh, let's say in siege warfare still it was not more important than the men at arms right uh, this is very often misunderstood the infantry could support the men at arms but these were the stormtroopers the infantry in great numbers as militias etc would serve just mostly to blockade the enemy settlements uh, all around the perimeter but there were also specialized troops again but lighter or less important at least than the men at arms and supporting them so the hierarchy actually remains the same in the art of war um, and more uh, this infantry begins to differentiate into specialties because that incredibly concerted and synergic effort of the various arms requires professionals that know how to perform also at, at a collective level ever better such um, specialties there is a consequence this that is to say the quality of stopping infantry decreases because these are you need lots of them to be effective and these are by definition not elite because they are too many right you can't overload them or nobody has the interest here even in the communes to equip the entire citizenry as um, some sort of professional troops that uh, you know rule uh, against the the knights this is not what happens the knights remain always there even in, with popular governments and crisis in the late 13th century kicks in uh, for which people begin to be slightly poorer and ever more and they don't want to go to war anymore so actually what makes the biggest shock is men at arms plus elite um, uh, crossbowmen right mostly so the aforementioned model we've seen with the cavalry in the center and this missile element on the wings without too much of a need of infantry after all because it was even say uh, except this missile one because the, those were enough to just uh, outflank the enemy in case of success and still the shocking force of the men at arms was more impacting there was a lot of money going around so the crisis was there but still you know by scale the, the system was pretty rich still so and it, it would basically remain so so at least for buying at that point it would make much sense to buy more and more men at arms which is what technically happens when infantry basically starts decreasing uh, in importance um, the Swabian Emperor Frederick II was a man of vast culture free from uh, prejudice, the prejudices that we usually attribute and often wrongly to the medieval world and with a keen interest as you know in the East even in Islam which also earned him a papal condemnation but it was having just a, so a complete universal understanding also because he was involved in 
in the Crusades even managing to recover Jerusalem without bloodshed, which is something that the papacy was not happy of because it was at least trying to uh, limit Frederick's power in Europe and such success was not that welcome. And having to resolve the conflicts and revolts caused in Sicily, however, by his Muslim subjects, they were a minority, mostly. They were actually Sicilians, but they had remained Islamic from the previous centuries, and they were brigands, etc. And um, Frederick basically crushed them. He picked he, the, the leader of them, and he disemboweled him with his spores in front of the other Muslims just to tell you the temper of the man. Um, and also deported a large part of them, about 60,000, probably were less, to the continent, concentrating a third of them in the city of Lucera in Apulia, in a very important strategic hub, right, from, from central to southern Italy. And this would become essentially a colony of Islamic mercenaries uh, in, in a Christian land. Right, and, and thus making these troops incredibly loyal to Frederick II because if, he, if they had gone out uh, there they would have not found literally anybody supporting them um, and the emperor's Saracens did not actually seize their revolts and attempts to return to Sicily by the way after two and a half centuries of Arab occupation in fact they considered the island uh, their homeland and just at this point these guys were born and raised there so it was just like an imposition that they didn't want to, uh, to suffer more than much but they no longer would constitute a danger and they were still depending again on Frederick that had de facto them in, uh, in his hands um, so with, with this move the emperor also achieved another important result that is the recruitment within the enclave of Lucera of a force of Saracen mercenaries, especially foot and horse archers. So lighter forces that were pretty much um, not really unknown in the West, but uncommon, um, and mostly pertaining to fringe areas from an ethnic point of view, like the Celtic world, etc. We're talking about a potential of around 6,000 men. And um, Frederick's forces were mighty, but they wouldn't manage actually to break the um, Lombard League that fought with conventional means. Of course, Frederick also had the same Ghibelline Lombards providing troops, and just he had his uh, German knights mercenaries, as a matter of fact, because again, the Sicilian feudal system had been going downhill from quite a while, especially with all those wars. Given that it was a very rich but also very politically fragmented and thus also quite bellicose land, Italy experienced a strong development of mercenary troops, notoriously well before the rest of Europe. Right? This was again driven by early urbanization, the wealth of the cities of the center north, the relative weakness of feudal institutions and naturally the intense conflict that troubled the peninsula. Um, this is um, again a, a great attraction uh, and as we've seen the mercenaries fighting in Italy really get a lot of insight about what uh, warfare is going to be about. This is true also for many noblemen because as we've seen we cannot distinguish them from mercenaries. Uh, Italians will call really like individual cities would call some German and uh, French uh, knights from Central Europe just to serve there and integrating them in their armies. It's renowned that uh, the Swiss infantry uh, served in the Lombard uh, wars and gained from there lots of, of insight regarding the Italian infantry tactics that would inspire their own. The same Dampierre dynasty of the Counts of Flanders served as French vassals in Angevin, Italy, and were very well aware of the role of the infantry, and they, they fight with that in Flanders. I mean, not because they copied it from the Italians, but that's actually because that's what the Flemish uh, towns fielded 
uh, but that strength of the infantry, the way they commanded them, the way they deployed them, lined them up, may have actually had a lot to do with that. Italian experience considered that the same Philip IV after Courtrai in the disaster that saw the massacre of so many French knights by the Flemish rebels hired um, Italian, um, specifically Lombard and Tuscan and Romagnol um, infantry, uh, mercenary infantry specifically, to cope against the, the Flemish and it resulted in important success. There was also the Battle of Zirikse, where there were Genoese admirals and crossbowmen fighting for the French, so uh, you always have there this uh, double exchange between Italy and the rest um, for the dynamics that we highlighted just now and that are quite unique in Europe, right? Uh, Germany is a quite big country at this point. Uh, it has reached and surpassed Italy in demographics, but uh, there is a crisis also there, uh, and the ministeriales, um, also this uh, essentially knights uh, right in uh, in Germany, are increasingly uh, taken over politically, juridically by the great princes of the empire that are creating some sort of mini monarchies on their own. Um, a reason for which this um, knights go to fight in Italy in very large numbers, right? Uh, as far as the most pop populous Italian cities, the, well, these did provide abundant infantry militias, as we've seen. Um, coalition armies reached easily 30,000 men. Um, this uh, troops, however, rarely remained idle. Uh, and in any case, they received compensation. So think about even the cost overall. It was enormous, right? Um, and as such, very heavy. Uh, thus, it was not long before incento, uh, incessant local warfare began to create the convenience and opportunity for the, um, say, the continued employment of uh, hired troops that would be less numerically, but more permanent in nature. Uh, this actually began uh, as a normal phenomenon within the Italians, because the rural nobility with their dependents, exiles from the cities that were being expelled at this point, uh, etc., expropriated or underemployed peasants from the Apennine or uh, Prealpine valleys, etc., uh, represented an abundant recruiting base. The Romagnols were, as we've seen, quite renowned, a bit like the, the Brabansons of, of Italy. Um, but the more a city expanded, the higher its demand for professional troops, uh, organized and led by commanders of proven skill and experience, that must be, however, faithful to the city. So arming too many commoners that, incidentally, at this point, like in today's economic crisis, actually can't fight, but they say, look, I, I'm, I'm tired, Let I don't want to risk my life legitimately, I will just pay somebody else for doing that, right, like for shipping me food or whatever, like we do with Amazon now. And, of course, um, a monopoly, these oligarchies would establish themselves. Um, also, the Italian regional states were being cemented under the lordships, accordingly, with the decline of the communal infantry. Um... Uh, this was the reason why the 14th century was the century of the consecration of medieval mercenaries. A bit all over Europe, right? This uh, service, again, from the Germans, for example, was quite appreciated also in France. We've seen how many Germans there were in the French armies uh, of the Hundred Years' War. Um, but we find different types of mercenaries, again, throughout the, the 14th century that come from, I don't know, think about the Bretons, the the Navarre rays, um, the Welsh at least in as new records for the English army, uh, etc. So we don't talk about this today. Uh, the scene, however, was uh, with the appearance of the first large companies that were essentially uh, autonomizing themselves uh, when the wars were over and and the crisis had brought to this political uh, 
divide, etc., to just act as wedges, right? Uh, in which uh, the scene was now ready to welcome the mercenary captains and their fellow businessmen. Think about the white company of the English veterans of the Hundred Years' War, like after the Treaty of Brittany and Similia, who would dominate the European battles, uh, battlefields in the following centuries, and would never really die out until essentially the, the 17th, right? And this aspect is often overlooked, and that's why I want to treat this, especially as far as the medieval roots of the system in another video much better because it's a much more important passage that must be gotten very well because it's not so intuitive per se and must be laid out concretely. There is a special mention however for uh, Roger de Flor, Roger de Flor uh, that I made a video on also about uh, his rise, first of all, but also about the, the cat so-called Grand Catalan Company uh, that made a, uh, an organization, army organization video, all right? Roger's life is shrouded in legion and perhaps ennobled by a complacent biographer. Um, you know, this was, again, a bit like there is the charm of the adventurer, the already sort of novelistic um, uh, romance about this figure. It was an actual historical one, there's no doubt. Uh, he was uh, a German-Italian guy, fundamentally that. Um, in fact, was born in Brindisi in 1267, right? Uh, he was son of Frederick II's falconer and a noble woman from the city. So we see still, essentially, noblemen, of course, uh, organizing the business of warfare. Ramon Montaner, the Catalan chronicler that was also a fellow soldier of his, describes his exploit. So there you have uh, the chronicle of Montaner is very famous and funny. I, I worked with it, um, had to learn my share of Catalan vernacular in order to do so. Um, like for, if anything, the, not just that, but a splendid. Uh, archive documentation of the uh, of the of the King of Aragon, right? That had this, you know, think uh, made a collection of all these documents. It's amazing about the war of the late 13th and early 14th century, documenting, for example, other countries, Italy, and we will explain now why, because there is a very interesting passage about this Catalans as well. But regarding Roger. Uh, he was orphaned at the age of um, a very young age at least and at, at eight he was started on a career on the Templar ships we talked about um, the him in the siege of Acre right when he was ac accused of embezzlement because essentially albeit he fought bravely apparently at least during the siege uh, while the troops were escaping under Mamluk um, pressure and the port did not have enough shipment, right? He seemingly made a lot of money because he could make some arrive, right? And this caused on uh, the anger of the Templar order who expelled him from it. Uh, around 1300, he, uh, Roger was an established naval commander ready to offer his fleet to the sovereigns overlooking the Mediterranean, uh, and especially in the contrast between um, the, let's say, in, in the context between the war between the Angevins and the Aragonese in Sicily, right? That was a lot about the noblemen of the interland, piracy, the major Angevin expeditions against Sicily, again, the Aragonese presence and this various troops. Um, in fact, Roger uh, became, in this context, a commander of some Catalan mercenaries known as uh, Almogavars, the term of Arabic origin, um, which uh, stresses say, their, their military tactics. Um, and this was, in fact, uh, as you know, a specialty appearing, like at least from the 10th century, probably also before, 
I just made a video about the tactic, the, the, say at least the warfare of Aragon, Catalonia and Navarre exactly around this time, the High Middle Ages. Um, beginning to identify, in fact, light infantry dedicated to the riskiest undertakings. Actually, also here you have knights, you have uh, all heavy troops as well, but prevalently they're a bit lighter, right? Not quite an army of light troops, right? They had mostly stopping infantry, so much so that they would later defeat uh, the perhaps in the most effective way, well, in a strictly tactical sense, but just once in that regard, the French cavalry of the Duke of Athens in Greece, right, in a, just with relatively scarce numbers and or uh, not that heaviness that you would think could simply stop a cavalry charge. Frederick III of Sicily and Aragon, in a truce in his war against the Angevins, managed to get rid of Roger and his Catalan company, that were definitely troublemakers, um, sending them to fight against the Turks for the Emperor of Constantinople. We are in post-Fort uh, Crusade times, and that, uh, as you know, inflicted a severe blow to the Byzantine Empire, essentially the Venetians and the French conquered Constantinople. This was essentially crushed um, as a as a military uh, in, by the Bulgarians quite early on, and basically the Latin Empire that was established by the the conquerors had lived very feebly until the the end of the 13th century, where the Palaiologoi Byzantines from Anatolia managed to reconquer, thanks to the Genoese support, um, Constantinople herself. Uh, so, at this point, the city was just a, an empty coffer of the previous splendor, but it could still, uh, and exactly for that in part, needed desperately uh, military help, right? And they could pay for some of it. Um, so what happens with the Catalan company there is that from 1303 and for over 80 years, the uh, uh, Aragonese troops not only inflict numerous defeats on the Turks, which is almost unbelievable if you look at it, but it proving, by the way, that you could easily defeat uh, them even as lighter and apparently not particularly wieldy or impacting forces because yes they were agile but they were mostly about uh, very primitive weapons and tactics like they weren't um, for the time state beings at least you know they, they were tactically articulate and complete but uh, say in ways that also we unfortunately don't have much of a concrete idea, especially as far as they were fighting against the Turks in the Anatolian interland. We don't have the exact details of how they fought. These battles were tactically solved. Um, but they succeeded, because of course it's not a matter of weapons or even of tactics, at least in a standard pack fashion, that really matters here. It's moral force, and the Catalans here are pretty angry, hungry, and ambitious. Uh, they were famous in these lands, they remained united and combative even after the treacherous assassination of its leader in 1305 because uh, Roger had thought surely of, you know, uh, the imperial crown of Constantinople but more and or more concretely about other business and he was fighting for the Byzantines as long as he w they would pay him but overall he had so many other options. And as you know, the relics of the Catalan company even managed to form an independent state in Greece that lived on till it was taken over by uh, by the Italians at some point. Um, in any case, uh, the um, aspect here that is often, uh, let's say, misunderstood is that every mercenary's effectiveness must be understood not as a story of this people or this guy that commanded them only at least, but also in terms of the general effectiveness and diachronic and comparative understanding of, in this case, medieval, the medieval art of war. Uh, 
when the Catalans, um, as we've seen, were freed uh, with the peace of Castabellotta from the Sicilian Neapolitan Wars, paradoxically, it was the Angevins that hired these previously enemy troops and scattered them as uh, contained garrisons in the major Guelph centers of Italy that depended on the Angevin hegemony. Uh, these centers had forces, as we've seen on, on their own. They had actually pretty impressive armies, especially the, the tally of Tuscany could put together again those 30,000 men without too much of a trouble and with an increased professionalization. So you can argue that these forces remained marginal and were just like the sort of minimal help that the Angevins could provide to their wealth allies. In any case, they were also... They were also there, they were employed in different circumstances by Florence, that was the center that used them the most because it was the biggest Guelph uh, city, the most important one, they had more Catalans. And they hardly distinguished themselves at all, right? In these engagements you never find, oh my god, the Catalans were so good in this place, they succeeded so much, right? The only moment in which they were actually pretty good was when Henry the Seventh, at the beginning of the 14th century, um, besieged Florence, but uh, didn't manage to take it. So he basically broke off the siege, and the Florentines went after him, without uh, engaging him in open field, but using, in fact, the Catalans as sort of um, salt on his tail, um, and this was, uh, and it's, it's here in this sort of. Um, Tuscan hilly terrain that uh, the the Catalan horsemen and infantrymen are the best to carry out ambushes, they take down some German knights but overall when they fight in pitch battles and the Ghibellines for example defeat disastrously the Guelphs at uh, the Battle of Montecatini in 1315 by the way using German mercenaries that were veterans from the uh, Henry the Seventh expedition, and at this point it was Pisa uh, hiring them. At least in that battle, there were others in the north as well. Um, the um, Florentine authorities are extremely pissed with the Catalans, that accu are accused actually of having made uh, an abysmal uh, figure in this combat. Actually. Some Catalan noblemen are praised uh, because these were the leaders and they fought as knights and they died in the battle, by the way. Uh, but the rest of the troops, the Florentines, go to the same king of Aragon with their ambassadors telling him that they don't want to hear about them anymore. This is fascinating, by the way, because Aragon was supposed to be a Ghibelline power but still was sending these troops. Um, through the Angevins to to Italy, and or at least even if there was a connection um, between Florence and Aragon more directly for the hiring of these troops, or some contacts between this nobleman and the motherland of some sort. To make the long story short, after that date, the Catalans literally disappear without any accomplishment registered um, from central northern Italy, right, and the um, the uh, the central northern Italians, in fact, begin to hire en masse German and French heavy knights. A proof of what? A proof that in a different regional context, the Catalans that could defeat the French heavy cavalry at Cephissus um, or the Turks in Anatolia are actually completely useless and basically thrown out just for hiring the heaviest type of cavalry type that existed in Europe at the time and that would be quite successful in dominating the battlefields also in the, uh, in the time of the soldiers of fortune of the condottieri and so on. Um, this is a, a reminder for saying just look it's not that if we live in, in the 21st century where people still think that an infantryman defeating a nobleman is something cool uh, because they're frustrated with with their own an accomplishment and they're socially envious. Uh, 
um, medieval warfare was actually about what you wish it was, right? Uh, and this thing of the Catalans in Italy and the, the preference from still these northern mercenaries, I think is quite telling. Uh, and it, it really tells you how actually deep and unknown and un understudied and misunderstood this time really is. Because there is a lot written on this uh, period, but hardly on the actual warfare side of things. Uh, and this is the reason also why I make this video, is because I think that uh, they're much more important than, of course, not just the amount of views that I receive, but generally speaking, also the uh, the actual usefulness that the topic has for assessing what medieval warfare actually was, not what we wanted to to have been, for whichever biased reason, right? This is the reason why for today I stop it here, but we will surely keep talking about this, hopefully, um, in the future. I just hope, however, that you enjoy this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.